Wow. You demanded it. We have delivered John Abbott part three and all of our stories of people who have been in US prisons but have ended up getting deported for some reason have massive interest. And John came on, did part two, and we put a clip out about the Hell's Angel assassin in California prison, which got a massive reaction. So huge thank you to John for coming back on so soon. Um, to people who are not familiar with your story, could you just give us a few sentences perhaps? Well, I, I think I came on a number, was it eight, something like that? Your first yeah. series of true crime. Very beginning. And uh, at that time it was, you know, basic my story coming through shoot up with the police prison san quentin escape capture again across the border into canada another shoot up with the police prison there and then finally getting out and getting deported to the uk and uh since then no more crime <laughs> no more crime that is a good thing uh are you thinking about getting a book about out about all these stories well, you know, over over the time, over the years, you, uh, things come to me, and I've written them down, and they've accumulated, and I've got a, a fair pile. As I've shown you some of them, so I think it may be time to uh, to put them together. I put a. Um, we're looking forward to that. I put a shout out to people to send in questions for you. And I've got some here, and um, I asked my assistant Amy in Alabama if she had any questions for you, and she said, um, "Ask him if he was in a situation." Where he had to do something to someone, would his blood pressure rise? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, actually, the one where my blood pressure went right through the roof was the opposite, where someone was doing something to me. And that was in the library in San Quentin when those BGF guys tried to hit with the knives and with the knives flashing, poking me here and there. And finally, when the guards came, I got taken off to the infirmary. And the guy put the blood pressure tube on me and it read 200 over 100 and he said you're o you're over amping boy and he went and got the medicine <laughs> 200 <laughs> over 100 and i can tell you you don't feel any pain you can't feel your feet on the ground in a sense you almost feel like superman but yeah. 200 over 100 wow so i asked you if you had any stories similar to the hell's angel assassin in california prison and your response was you had a story about putting an ice pick to a biker's eye in san quentin what happened there well do you remember I, I i mentioned one of the problems in prison is how do you how do the prisoners police each other for example someone steals something from you what do you do um you're not you, you can't go to the police there's no police so when i was in san quentin there were no orange monkey suits everybody wore blues and some people if you took the state clothes they were sort of shapeless baggy blues but you could buy your own and so you could have levi blue jackets and levi jeans and so the people who had money you could soon see because they were styling they were wearing blue jeans and the, and the fish, you just came off, off onto the line. They were all wearing, you know, laundry bag kind of blue state clothes. And so of course we wanted to be wearing the jeans and because the jeans were a precious commodity, you know, it was a $20 bill at that time for a pair of blue jeans, which was $30 ducats. So you didn't want them out of your, your sort of cell where they could just disappear. And so when you wash them, you'd hang them up on a line from sort of the toilet to the bed frame at the back of the cell. Anyway, so I come back to the cell with my celly, and he looks and he says, something's wrong. And he looks around and the brand new Levi's that he bought are gone. He says, we've been fished. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well... They get, a, they get a, a wire with a hook on the end, a stiff bit of wire, and they just pull it off the line. And, you know, so 
Well, I said, well, what can we do? And he says, well, you know, it's gone. I said, yeah, but th that's not enough, you know, because, but this time we were doing business in San Quentin. We were doing tier sales. We were doing the TV guide. We were lending money. We were selling TV sets. You know, he was into selling the, selling the speed. And so you got a business, you got your, your company reputation to maintain. It's, it's, and so I said, we got to do something. And so I said, ask the guys, ask the fellas, because we had some about five, six guys in the, in the area. We lived up on the fifth tier, very, the highest part. And because it was the fifth tier, people didn't go up there unless you lived up there usually. Because one reason is there were no nets at San Quentin. There was just a three bar handrail. And if you went off the fifth tier, you just splattered like an egg on the on the pavement. You're done. Nobody survived that. Did you ever see anyone go off the fifth tier? Well, you're you're, you're taking me in a different direction. Oh, slow sorry. down, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I said I said to Phil, I said, well, let's put the word out, see if anyone was up there, see if anyone suspicious was around. And so, about thirty minutes later, we get a list of suspects, and it was Mendez the Mexican cleaner. Now he's a dope fiend, Mexican, or he wasn't a Chicano. And he used to, you know, move that mop, but he'd kind of linger outside people's cells and give it the eye as he went along, you know? So that was, he was on the top of the list. And the second guy was Buster the Biker, right? Now he'd been up there, and the guys at our end of the tier, there weren't any bikers there. So, you know, what, what was he doing up there? So his name went on the list. So I said, we got to move fast if there's any chance, you know, that these blue jeans are in sight. So uh, I got I got an ice pick and he got a uh, cut down. Um, it used to be a, a paint scraper, but it had been uh, filed down nicely. And so uh, we found out where these guys lived. And then the choice is, how do you go in? Do you go to the guy and say, well, we want to search your cell? And of course, the hackles are going to go up. He's going to tell you to go fuck yourself. It's going to be a big drama. His adrenaline's going to start pumping. Now, when people's adrenaline go, then they become like Superman, like I just said. And, you know, they could get stabbed to death and still be fighting. And they won't even notice it till the adrenaline cooks off. So I said, well, it's got to be a surprise attack. You know, there's only one way to do this. Right? And so we ran into Mendez's cell first. And he had his, he was on the shitter. He had his pants and his ankles. And he just stuck the needle in his arm. The fit was in his arm. And he was done. We had him, you know. And the look on his eyes, he just looked at us with this totally resigned look like, I'm done. These guys are going to cut my throat. There's nothing I can do. Absolutely nothing. And so he was just there frozen on the toilet with the, his pants around his ankles. And we went through a cell and searched it. We found nothing. Now, the rules of engagement were if we don't find anything, we just, we just leave because, you know, you can't get paranoid and just knife the guy just for the sake of doing it. So then we went down to Buster the biker's cell. And I ran into his cell, jumped on his chest. And he, unlike me, you have, two, you have two choices in San Quentin. You can, the shitter is at the end of the cell. Now you can put your head one end of the bunk, which means it's going to be down here, the shitter. Or you can put your head at the other end of the bunk, which is going to be up at the bars. Now, it depends what's important in your life. So for some people, that smell of shit, they just can't deal with that. But for me, if I'm at the other end down near the shitter, I can see who comes into my cell. And I'm looking at them. So I got a second or two to move. But if your head's up at the door, you, they're on you before you can you even realize it. And I was on Buster. I jumped on his chest. I yarded back his greasy hair. And I put the ice pick under his left eye. And I said, don't move. We're searching your cell. And Buster, he just looked at me and he said, cool. 
Now, and that meant that, that I'd done it right. Because what you don't want is you don't want a big drama. Now, a nice pick, I don't know, do you think it's a, a dangerous weapon? Definitely. Well, it is and it isn't. If I stick you with a nice pick in about 99% of your body, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to do any permanent damage and it won't slow you up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when I pull it out, it's almost self-sealing like those tires on the bicycles these days, right? Yeah. But there is a good place to put a nice pick. And that, you put it right under the fellow's eye, right here. And you don't, you're not aiming to poke the eye out, but if he struggles, if he suddenly goes crazy, if you jam that ice pick up, it'll go up through, there's an eggshell thin bit of bone above the eye, and, it, and the tip of the ice pick will go straight into the frontal cortex. Oh. And if you yard that around a bit, you've just given him a frontal lobotomy. And there's a good chance he won't even know what happened. And there won't be much blood either. So there's almost no blood. That's if he struggles. Anyway, Buster didn't struggle. We searched his cell. We couldn't find anything. And so we left. Now, there's going to be a downside to this because those are two major violations. And so... Can I, can I get, get, guess? Yeah, you, you've crossed the racial line with the Mexican. And um, the bikers yeah. saw retaliation from both sides. Well, yes and no, because it turned out that Mendez was a, was a Mexican. And he didn't like Chicanos. He just thought they were basura, right? Which, which means garbage. Right? And the Chicanos, they tried the old La Raza rap with him about, you know, this is major disrespect. You can't let the white boys do this, you know. But he didn't want to hear it. it. didn't mean anything because we did basically what would have happened in Mexico, right? Just that's how, we're, that's what would have happened, you know? And so he didn't have a Paisa gang back in him. No, he was, he was one of the others and there were so few others. There was not much to say. It's not maybe like Arizona or New Mexico. Yeah. Now Buster the biker, he, he was a biker, but he wasn't patched. So, also, we were putting speed out. And speed is the drug of choice for these biker boys, right? And so, we were in tighter than he's going to be in, because he didn't have a pot to piss in, with his own friends. So, that kind of neutralized that side of it. And also, we didn't piss him off. Like, there was no slapping him around. There was no hurting him. He was immobilized immediately. The cell was checked immediately and we left. So the whole thing was over before he could even get excited about it. And so actually, that worked out all right because we wanted to give a message that, I mean, to be, to be straight up honest, I think the blue jeans went into the Mexican's arm and we were too late because that would have got him a cap of stuff and he was probably on his way. But we, we'd sent the message, and the message was, yes, there will be retaliation. We will come for you. Now, fortunately, nothing, nobody got hurt. There was no major repercussions, so it went down all right. I've got a few follow-on questions from this, then. And if anyone's watching this, that was an absolute masterclass in storytelling. If you want to come on the podcast, take some notes, just the, the descriptive ability, setting the scene, the action, I'm just sat here absolutely gripped. John is totally on form today. So I was in a cell once that had two bunks and I had a situation with a person and I, I was contemplating, like you said, head at the front, head at the back, top versus bottom as well. So I was thinking, right, if I'm on the top, head at the back, someone comes in who's an enemy you know, at least I'll be coming downwards. I could use that downward motion to perhaps kick that person in the head, kick him in the chest. But if I'm on the bottom bunk, they could just fall on me as I'm trying to get up. What's your assessment of the situation, you're top versus bottom? You're exactly right, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Because in Quentin at that time, everybody wanted the bottom bunk, okay? And oh. so the fish or the guy, the new guy who just came in, he got pushed on the top bunk. 
But I was happy to be on the top bunk because I didn't want anyone above me, you know, making noise like that. And I didn't want the shitter right in my face. And so being in the back corner there, it's going to be kind of hard for anyone to get at you. And you're going to have enough time to react, which is the key point. Now, Buster the Biker had no time at all, which was good for him. And that was, you know, he was dozing with the, with the, with the cells racked open. And that's a major no-no as far as I was concerned. In, in prison, in San Quentin, if, the, if those gates rack open, you're up. You, you don't be sleeping in your bunk with the gates open, with the doors open. Now, I don't know how it was in your prison, but in Quentin, they rack the gates in the morning so people go to work. And then when people came back, they closed them. And so everybody was locked in. But in between that, you could still shut your, your, your door and you could padlock it. And everybody had their own padlock. So, of course, you can't padlock it from the inside. So it was padlocking when you went to work, so people didn't go in and steal your stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we had a variety of door situations. It depended upon the security level. But in like medium, it's um, the guards activate it from the fish, from the bubble. They press buttons and it pops your door open now. Uh, this is, technology's probably advanced from when you were. I think San Quentin's still the same as it always used is to be. Is it? Yeah. Wow. So a guard... First, they, they pull the great big iron yeah. handle like the old steam engines. Wow. Know, and it racks all the gates open. Yeah. And then the guy comes by with the key and he keys them open. The yeah. Guard, and then he keys them shut when they lock you in. But then if you want to protect your stuff, you got these little cheesy padlocks ah. that they used to sell. Wow. So. <laughs> okay. So during that talk, I rudely interrupted and said, had you experienced or seen anybody going off the fifth tier and splatting? Well, no, because you, you go up there and <laughs> I don't know if you're afraid of heights, but just going up there was nervous enough. And to sort of lean over the tier, you better be trusting whoever you're standing behind you, right? So, so the black boys didn't like being up on the fifth tier much. So we kind of made it our own little preserve up on the top there. Right. And it was it was good that way because, you know, if people did go up there, you noticed them. Whereas yeah. if you're down on the bottom where it's just like a highway, there's, you know, people going and coming. So. Yeah. Okay. So the next topic then is disrespect in prison. How does that work? Oh, well, that's a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, prisoners don't have money. And they don't have cars and they don't have jewelry and they don't have guns, but they do have one thing and that's their respect. And respect becomes everything. It, it tells who you are and where you stand in the hierarchy. And we're, we're like pack apes, you know, and there's a, I don't know if you've been to the zoo and watched the chimps or the monkeys. Oh yeah. I love watching the monkeys and chimps. Yeah. Well, the big male, the alpha male, he's on top and he's on the boss and, and then there's the sort of secondary and the thirds and they're all here and there and he's watching this the scene and there's always a drama where different ones are trying to push ahead and improve their status and so respect is really important and the more time you spend there the more respect you feel you should get now this is an invisible thing like if you think about it why should some convict who spent 20 years in prison get respect i mean if you think from an outside viewpoint you'd say well he's just a loser who didn't learn his lesson and uh you know that's the way it goes but if you're inside you feel you've earned your bones you know you've you've gone through it you've been in it you, you, you know you've had dramas happen it's like years of military service and so you should get respect anyway so in the one that came to me i mean at the beginning when i started doing my time i didn't know the situation this didn't know the scene didn't belong to a gang so I thought to myself, don't get involved with drugs, don't borrow money, and if you don't have anything, nothing's going to get stolen from you. Well, that's all well and good while you, you start out until you get over your sort of initial like fear of the place. And then you start thinking, well, you know, I'm in this society, and I'm right at the bottom of the pile. And 
how comfortable do you feel being at the bottom of the pile? And so after I'd escaped and come back, I sort of felt that respect was really important now. And I wasn't going to put up with disrespect. And so I, I got my challenge at um, the Vacaville Reception Center at Chow Time. So I'm lined up for Chow. And, you know, everyone's standing there with their tray. And there's a Vato in front of me, some Chicano gang member. And obviously one of his carnales is serving the food. And he's on the, he's on the salad. And the salad that day was lettuce and cherry tomatoes. And so the Vato Loco gets a bowl full of cherry tomatoes. And I get a bowl full of green lettuce. You know? Now lettuce, I mean, it's nothing. It tastes like nothing. There's no nutrition. <laughs> and which is the reason they always put it in salads, right? You know, restaurants and places. And I looked at this. And, you know, the guy obviously thought, you know, I was a punk and he just, and that's how it went. And so I went and sat down at my table and I'm stewing and stewing and I don't want to eat and I'm getting more and more angry. And I see, I see this guy who who'd served the salad come off the line and he takes off his apron and he goes and sits with a couple of friends at a table. So I get up and I go over there. And I say to him, you know, what the fuck with the tomatoes, man? And he just looks at me. Now, what I, I mean, I could have said, chingas to puta madre, pinche pendejo. And maybe that would have taken things in one direction, but I didn't, right? I, I thought to myself, I got to do something, but just jumping on a guy in the chow hall in front of the guards is bad, bad magic, right? And he just looks at me and I look at him and then I go sit down. But before I, I sat down, I noticed that there was another Vato Loco sitting with him, but there was a white kid sitting with him too. So I, I took a look at this white kid and then I went and sat down and I started pondering my next move. So the next day out in the yard, uh, I was with my crime and I, we looked over and saw that white kid sitting. So I said to this guy, Iron Mike, I said, Mike, go over and have that kid come over to the rec shack. And so um, Iron Mike goes over and brings the kid over to the rec shack. And we're inside the rec shack. And Mike sort of just gently pushes him in. And he's looking around like, you know, what's going on? And I said to him, uh, I said, do you co-sign with that Chicanos did yesterday? And he's just looking at me like he doesn't even know what I'm talking about, right? And as soon as he looks a bit confused, my crime, he just backslaps him, bam, across the face. Down, down he goes into the, the dirt. His head hits the, you know, where they have the limer for a baseball field. And he starts crying. There he is on the ground crying. So I step over to him and I say, you know, I said, this only happened because you were sitting with some Chicanos. I said, if you sit with Chicanos and some white boys having a beef and you're sitting with the Chicanos, that means you co-sign that play, that you're, you're, bat, you're in that car, you know? And, oh, he says, I, I, I'm no, I, you know, I just knew them at the county jail. They're, you know, they're not, they're, you know, uh, excuses, right? And I said, well, this is, this is the prison. And, you know, you sit with a guy and he gets into a beef, then you're automatically in the beef, whether you want to be there or not. I mean, you might think you're just sitting there at a chair, but if you're with a guy, as far as other people watching, you're you're back in his play. And so, I didn't I didn't get any any more cherry tomatoes that day, but I did finally get a feeling of what's the expression closure. <laughs> That reminds me of when I first went into the county jail. I was working out with a Chicano gang member from La Victoria, a uh, Tempe sniper. And um, the woods come up to me. They're like, look around the room. Do you see any other white boys working out with the other races? I'm like, no. Why? <laughs> like, 
Got a lot to learn, fish. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I think I've got a few more following questions from that actually as well. So when we had Darren G in here, we talked about fear versus respect. And I mentioned two Tonys had a lot of respect he'd put in. 30 plus years by the time I met him, he was serving 140 plus year sentence. You know, he was a, a small old man. He wasn't one of these guys running around, you know, with the chests out and, and, and beating people up. So a new person coming in might think, you know, he's just like some nobody upstairs on his bunk reading the book. But actually, he's one of the most respected people in there versus the guys who are in your face who are all, you know, puffing the chests out. So is respect how is respect earned then? And and is what's the difference between fearing someone and respecting someone in prison? Well, I as far as San Quentin was concerned, you can have as as fancy a respect as as as, as anyone will give you on the street. Yeah. But it doesn't translate to the prison yard. Yeah. The prison yard it's like the savannah in Africa with the hyenas and the and the, the lions and the wild dogs and everybody's teeth are out and whoever gets the bite in first wins. And you don't want to be an old man. As, as many bodies as you might have put in the ground with the mafia. It, so what what would happen in Quentin is they would those kind of guys would be transferred off to uh, to Hatchapi, where they put the oldsters, the old uh, old hairs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it's too feral, is it? It's just feral. It's wild. And, wow. And fear e equals respect. So, and the fear means, will this guy stab me? That's the basic line. And you look into his eyes and you look how he carries himself and you say, is this guy, is he up for it? Now, if you look into two Tonys, I don't know what he looked like or what he was like, but would he physically be able to die? Yeah, he would still fight people if, if it went down to it. Yeah because yeah he was proud of that he got in some fights he lost against younger people but he was proud that he threw down and was you know yeah well i would suggest that basically it's like those nature dramas you know the lion chases away two hyenas but three hyenas start biting its ass you know and it doesn't matter how famous the lion is three hyenas you know yeah wow and you know from your lifestyle then going in um you, you talked about how you had to the story you just gave us how the you know you showed that you were down and that proved you got respected but um what about when you first went in how did you have to learn that well this is the thing when you first go in you don't know anybody yeah you don't belong to a gang and not only that, but unlike a lot of the guys who'd gone through youth authority and they'd been trained up since they were 15 years old for this life, I went into it as whatever I was, 20 years old, 21 years old, and with no experience. And so there was a big learning curve that I had to come up with to see where I was. And at the beginning, because I was physically nothing to look at, that was my priority was to, you know, make sure that I could do more sit-ups, run further, lift more weights. Whatever it was, I could do it more and better than most people. And then your confidence grows. And then as you see how the game is played and how it works out, you see what the do's and don'ts are. And also there's basic rules. I mean, <laughs> when I watch these guys talk about how hard they are, there's nobody who's hard. You want to do a hardness test, you go buy a Sunday ham and you put it on a sideboard and you take a vegetable knife for a point and just plunge it right into it. And that's how hard you are. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> wow. Speechless. <laughs> and so that's, we're, we're bags of blood and guts and a few bones. So we're not hard at all. What we can be though, is you can have intuition. You can have quickness. You can have common sense. You can sense out the right answer at the right time. And 
this is how we got ahead in life. We're not that hard. We're not that strong. We're not that fast. But we're a lot smarter than the other animals. And so in prison, that's what you got to be too. You, can, you have to have a certain level of physique and, and, and ability to carry yourself. But you sure got to have some common sense and avoid all the pitfalls. So someone coming in then who's not got that physique, do you recommend they get on that right away? Right away. I mean, and you'd be surprised at what you can do. Well, I showed you those pictures. Yeah, you know? massive. I mean, it was just... Like a Viking? Night and day, right? Yeah. And that made, that made a big difference. I mean, I, when I was in Canada, we used to play uh, kind of ragged foot. What, what, you, what we call Canadian football, it's not soccer. It's, you know, tackle and throw the ball. And, you know, I had this guy, he was, he was, you know, one of the tattooed guys and, and he tackled me and he got up and he said, you know, it was like tackling a tree. Now I'm not that big and thick because I was working out all the time. Your muscles are dense. Yeah. And that, that gets some physical respect. And this is what's important in prison is physical respect because we're animals. This, you're, you're right on the savanna. You're not in the library. You're not a, you know, in anywhere civilized. So you're operating on that level. Yeah. So you said the newbie should come in, work on his physicality and avoid the pitfalls. What are the pitfalls and how are they avoided? Well, I'll give you an example. In San Quentin, there was this guy I knew called Ralph Pitts. And Ralph had, he'd done a home invasion with a samurai sword. So he was a lively boy himself. But when he got to San Quentin, he felt completely out of his depth. And so he started going to the chapel. And he became a Christian. And he tried to immerse himself in his work. So he was a welder. He got a job in the welding shop. And he worked and worked. And when he wasn't working, he'd go to the chapel. And then he'd come back with the Bible and read it. And he was married. He had a family. And he had a gold wedding ring. So one day he's in his cell, Sunday, and his two Chicanos come in and they say, hey, Holmes, you know, nice ring you got there, bro, you know. I mean, I've been thinking about getting one from my canal, you know. Can I have a look at that, man? You know, that's pretty cool. And he goes and takes off his wedding ring and hands it to this guy. And the Chicano just pockets it and the two of them leave his cell. And Ralph is just, you know, he's stunned and he comes up to talk to me. He comes up right like a couple hours later, he comes upstairs and he says, John, what should I do? Because I'd known him from Vacaville. And I said, well, you know, this is the fork in the road. I said, before they, those guys sell it for some heroin, you, you get a pipe and go down there and just get them. Try and get the, both of them, but at least get one. Or I said, you, sh you shine it on, you go with Jesus and turn the other cheek. And Ralph turned the other cheek. And I mean, a couple months later, I saw him. He'd been in the canteen line. He got a big bag of canteen because he had a good job. He's a welder. He got $30 a month. I don't know how much they used to pay you guys, but $30 a month was considered 50 good. cents an hour was the most you could get in Arizona. Some of us at 10 cents an hour. Well, he was, he was at the top end as far as we were concerned. And he got a big bag canteen and he'd taken two steps and a guy just grabbed the canteen bag out of his arms and just walked off. And he's just standing there shaking because Ralph was a violent guy himself, but he was desperately trying to get out to be with his wife and kids. But the problem was he'd lost respect. As soon as he walked into the chapel, being a fish going to the chapel, he had no respect. Now, some of those guys in the chapel are down-home gangsters <clears throat> from 20, 30 years. And so they can make that play and not, not lose completely because they've had past respect. But he'd just gone straight to the chapel. And as far as he'd, he basically thrown the white flag up and said, take from me whatever you want. And I don't know what else happened to Ralph, but that was a hard road to hoe, that one. Next subject, how does an ex-con deal with that mindset outside? Now, that's a tough one. You can get yourself in trouble. I was, um, I, that's one of the things I won't abide with disrespect. Still, it still rankles me. And I'm afraid 
I, I'm not going to call it PTSD. I'm just going to say it's a habit that I acquired that it's hard to. So one night I was, uh, I was in London and I took the last train, the underground from Northern Line, center of London up going north. And I'm on this train carriage, one end. And there's about 15 guys, no women, just 15 guys on the train. And we'd stop at a station. And all of a sudden, these two young black guys come on. And one of them is, you know, the classic wedge face, goatee, Somalian kind of guy. And the second guy was kind of like real stocky, but not too tall. And I'm watching. And these guys steam through the carriage, slapping the face, taking the headphones out and throwing them on the ground, knocking the paper out of the hands of every guy as they move up the, the carriage. Every single guy. Now, they weren't whacking them full on. They just disrespecting them. And these guys just sat there. Now, <laughs> I'm just starting to boil. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off, not because they can try and do it to me. I'm pissed off for what these other guys are not doing. See, his blood pressure does rise, Amy, at times. <laughs> <laughs> so they're moving along the train. And, and, you know, this is London. So there were maybe two or three white guys, and the rest were kind of different off-brand colors, as you often see in London. But nobody was doing anything. Anyway, so they, they start coming up to me. And coincidentally, now, it's not something I do normally, but coincidentally, I happen to have a buck knife in my pocket. Oh, God. Jesus. Now, of course, I know that it's not good to have buck knives in your pocket, so I don't do that now. But I happen to have had one that particular time. And so as the Somalian starts coming towards me, I had the buck knife out, and I just showed him the blade, right? I just looked at him and showed him the blade. And he just just turned past me and started jamming these other two guys, right? And that, out he went to the next carriage to carry on. And the little guy spotted this young white guy, and I guess he felt that he wanted to make an extra point for him, right? So we started to go over and say something to him. So I, I put my knife away and I walked over to, this, to the guy and I said, you know, you don't want to hear that shit. And I'm just about to paste him. I'm giving him the look and I'm just about to paste to me. He must have sensed it or something because he just, then off he went too. So, so that, was, that was an experience where I could have got myself in a lot of trouble because of this respect thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, that's a London story for you. So yeah. I asked one of the guys, I said, what's up? Why is everyone just sitting there? He says, oh, they probably have knives, you know. But can you imagine? I don't know. How does that sit with you? So this is, everything you're saying is triggering a story in me because it's this parallels, not at the intensity of what you've been through and what you've done. Um, so. I've been out for a year, still a bit institutionalized. I'm a mellow person, you know, I'm not a violent person or anything. I get a moving van, a one way to move from the north to the south, move all my stuff into the new place. And then it's already been arranged that we've taken it back to this other place that's going to accept a one way drop off. So me and the guy I lived with, Hot Wheels, go to this place to drop this van off. So there's some lads in there behind the counter and they're quite cocky to start with. And they say, look, you can't park that there. You got to park it over there. So I'm thinking that's a bit weird, you know, but these guys are a bit lippy, but I'll just go with it. So I move it from one part of the car park to another part of the car park. Then I go in and say, look, just dropping this off. It's a one way, you know, here's my paperwork. Oh, we don't take one ways. We don't take one ways. And I said, well, look, I've already paid for it. It's organized. Here's, here's the paperwork. What am I supposed to do? And they basically started to tell me to fuck off out of there. So I just, the red mist just came over me. And um, I was yelling at them. And Mike was pulling me back. 
I just wanted to, to, to get this one guy who'd mouthed off the most and Mike was pulling me back. Anyway, we, I, we, I think I just threw the key at him and we got out of there. So on the way back, because I've, I've known Mike for years and he was like, I've never, ever seen you like that before in my life. But it's that mindset. I still had that mindset. And you can't be disrespected like that if someone gets in your face like that. But then I learned something else, which was important. So I'm in, um, I'm in the South now and I've joined a karate club. And I've been doing karate for a few years. And we go out with all the karate black belts one night in London to watch a fight. Now, we come back, get off the train at the station in town. And we're walking into town and we're going over the bridge. And there's a bunch of drunks approaching from the other side of the bridge. And one of them um, kicks a can at the black belts and goes, come on, motherfuckers. So I'm thinking, right. Prison mentality, disrespect, this has got to go off. The black belts walked through those guys as if they didn't exist, and the conversation never even skipped a beat. And so I had to go and analyze that then in my head. And um, I spoke to an eighth Dan black belt recently. I told him the story. And it's like, by, you know, they knew what they could do to those guys. And they were inconsequential. Why even, you know, waste that energy on them and, and cause what could have been, you know? Well, the other thing is, if they did do anything, because they have black belts, they'll be the ones who get whacked by the police. Yeah. The drunks will just, of course, be the local postie or, you know, some delivery driver. But these guys were black belts and they should have known better. So, yeah, that's another aspect. But that taught me the mature response. Well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> have, have, have you not? <laughs> How long has it been since you've been out, John? <laughs> well, this is what I'm saying. This stuff gets imprinted on you pretty deeply, right? Yeah, yeah. When it, when it, when it's your life is on the line, yeah, you just don't turn it off by walking out the gate, right? No, no. I mean, you can stay away from always stuff. Something in you, yeah. I mean, I stayed away from the biggest problem most guys have is they go back, they get out of prison, and they go back to the same neighborhood they come from. So everybody knows their reputation. They can't get jobs because they're known as a crim. Um, the only people they know are other crims or people who knew them when they were a crim. And eventually, just uh, almost automatically, they slip back into it. So the best thing you can do when you get out is go to some completely new place where you don't know anybody and you can reinvent yourself then you have a chance. But to be shunted back to the same old sink estate with, you know. And cycled back into the private prison. And yeah, it's never ending then, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's a respect um, issue with the dairy cow. Um, I've got uh, some dairy cows, and one of them's named Chopon. And she's a really good cow. She's uh, calm and... Mm, gives a lot of milk and she never causes trouble and she's a joy. And so I was walking one day um, back from the field to the stable and she was walking along and all of a sudden this kind of big male youngster just suddenly pushed in front of Chopin and like, like just muscled her out of the way. And Without even breaking stride, without even her head sort of seeming to move, she just dipped her head and stuck her horn right up his asshole. Oh! Bam! And he just <laughs> jumped and was out of the way. Right? <laughs> and I was really impressed. I thought, yeah, I understand that exactly. She just gave him the message, right? <laughs> so... We share that with dairy cows. And people don't think dairy cows are like that because most of the time they spend their time just sort of in the, the dairy factory. Chewing grass, whatever. But if you uh, get to know them, yeah. Yeah, they got character. How criminal justice works out inside, as in how do the convicts police themselves? Well, that story about Buster, uh, by, uh, Buster the biker and, and Mendez the Mexican cleaner, that was an example of... Um, 
policing inside prison. But do you have any other stories of policing inside prison? <sighs> well, this is a story of business competition. So it kind of is like bit like policing, but so we were running tier sales, and that meant we would um, we would buy bulk cases and cases of Coca Cola and Fanta sodas, and they cost twenty five cents a can at that time, and then we'd get blocks of ice from the ice machine in the kitchen and we'd f get them ice cold and we'd send people out on the tier selling them for 50 cents so that's like a hundred percent markup and that that was a good little hustle and the guys who did it were part of our tip so they they got it was like a salary they were getting and we were getting money from it and so we had a lock on east block bayside and one day Fast Frank, Fast Frank for Joni. He comes up and he says, son of a bitch, but uh, Cadillac Jack has started his own crew of tier sales guys. Now, Cadillac Jack, um, he was an interesting guy. We called him Cadillac because um, in the prison, you were allowed $100 canteen a month. And most guys could earn twenty dollars, thirty dollars on these. You know, if you were a cleaner, you get about twenty. If you worked as a welder, you might get thirty. But he, this guy, he didn't have a job, but he could just, you know, spend the full hundred every time. So he spent a yard every month, which was a Cadillac, and he was he was the man, right? He had money. So Cadillac Jack, he managed to buy himself a job as the canteen clerk, and so my guys went to buy some sodas and they went to the canteen and the canteen said sorry out of supply we don't have any and then that evening we watch as this chinese guy and mendez the mexican cleaner uh, are selling canteen are selling uh, sodas ice cold sodas on the tears and our guys aren't because they can't buy any so you know business management case study number 101 what do you do <laughs> You've just been frozen out of your <laughs> your location. Is the response going to involve an ice pick <laughs> <laughs> by a competitor? <laughs> so I said to Frank, I said, "This isn't any good." We said, "We got to do something about this." And Frank said, "Well," he said, that "I could, you know, bar the lock off the guy's door without any trouble." And I said, "That's a good plan." So. I walked down to see Cadillac Jack thinking we should talk about this first before any action's taken. And Cadillac Jack was an interesting guy. He, he was a cartel pilot. He'd flown so the uh, Las Drogas across in the airplanes, right, across the border, and been deep in that trade. And I guess he fell out with somebody because he had his partner whacked. He, he didn't do it himself. He paid somebody to do it. And as usually happens, the guy he paid to do it ended up testifying against him. And so he got first degree murder. He just missed the death penalty because it was premeditated. And there he was in San Quentin. But he was a smart guy and he was a businessman and he wasn't the usual thug. So I used to enjoy talking to him. But anyway, I went down that time and Cadillac Jack sees me and he lights up a cigar big cigar he's got and he says it's not a cohiba robustos but you know and he's got 30 cases of sodas just all the cases that we'd wanted to sell he's got stacked up in his cell right to the ceiling eh? so i said to jack i said you know is this necessary right i mean you're you're cadillac jack you got all the money you can spend and he says well he says uh, just like your you know tv guide sales he says it's a free country, and I'm making more money. It's a free country, he said to me. So I said, well, good luck with the store, Jack. So I slipped out of there and went back. And the next day, he went to the canteen to do his job, and Frank and the boys just barred, you know, took the lock off and walked off with all his supplies. And then we were back in business again. And... I let it go a day or two. I sent guys, about four or five guys, I sent them down to see Jack and ask if they had anything, you know, if he had any sodas they could buy. <laughs> and after priming him up 
about three, four times like that. I went down to the to the to Jack's cell and I said, "Jack, how's the store going?" And he looks at me and he says, "Ask your friends." I said, "Jack, I said you're too light in the ass for this, and who needs the the hassle? Who needs the aggravation? You know, because you know he." And so, I mean, other guys would have knifed him and chased him off into PC or done something like that, but we didn't do that. We just played a selfie, and I said, Jack, just, you know, enjoy your life here. And so he just kind of receded into the woodwork, and we didn't hear any more about Cadillac Jack. Or, <laughs> so we were back in business. And What motivated him to, um, to do that then? He's, he's, he's got finances. Why rock the boat? Because it's the same reason why a multimillionaire wants to be a billionaire. Now, why does anyone want to be a billionaire? <laughs> I mean, can't, you can't spend the money. I mean, you can't even spend a hundred million pounds. I mean, why do people do it? It's just it's counters in the in the game of greed, life, right? Or just well, like program. I'm not going to call it greed. I'm just going to say guys like playing games, and that's mm. a game, and those are the counters. You know, if you're you want to go to the party and you want to sort of boast, you know, I'm, I'm a better game player than you. I'm Jeff Bezos and you're only Bill Gates, right? Or whoever, right? So, and you're right. I mean, why would you do that? But for Jack, he just saw a business opportunity and he, he went at it like you would in the street. He froze out the competition, replaced it, got a product for a cheaper price, and did everything that would have worked on the street. But it wasn't a free country. He was in San Quentin. So, What about business strategies that would ingratiate you then with the prison population? I'll give you an example. So let's say a guy high up in the gang, he's got a lot of disciplinary tickets, and he can't get store that week or for the next couple of weeks. And someone like um, lets him put money on their books. Now, if that person gets attacked, they get moved. His money's gone. So he's got protection then from that person. Do you ever hear any, any strategies like that? I don't. Uh, these guys weren't thinking too in too complicated fashion. Right. It, was, it was more like, who can I muscle for enough cash to buy a cap of heroin to get high? Yeah. And that was basically where it was at. Mm. I mean. <laughs> were, were, were the staff members bringing the drugs in? I'm sure they were, but I never, I, I was never, I, I was never into the drugs because as mm. far as I could see, after race, drugs were the most dangerous thing on the yard. Yeah. Drug debts. Uh, drug debts. And, People acting up on drugs. Well, and, and, and also, if you want the drugs, like. For example, there was a guy in Canada I knew, this Dave McCaskill. He was a dope fiend, but he used to bet with my book and, and he'd pay his debts. And he sort of established, uh, I don't know, a uh, reputation with me in that when he made a, a debt, when he made a bet and he lost, he paid, which was saying something considering the people in the prison, right? And he came to me one day and he said, well, I want to borrow $20. Because he knew there was some good heroin on the line, but he didn't have any money that day. So he said, two for three. You give me $20 cash, I'll give you $30 cash in a week. Now, he's a dope fiend, so you can't go to the Better Business Bureau and check his credit rating, right? I mean, whoa. <laughs> so I had to just go on the invisibles. Like, he paid his debts with my book. And... It was only $20. If it worked, I was making 50% profit in a week, which isn't a bad turnover. So I gave it a chance and it went through. Okay. And sure enough, he'd come back with 30. And we did that a couple, we did that twice. And I thought to myself, well, this isn't going in too bad a direction, you know? But of course, in the world jet he was in, you know, he, he, he wanted to go to the next level, which is, because he's a dope fiend, if you're chasing the drugs, you never really get the good drugs, and you're also in competition with all the other fiends. But if you can bring in a package, then you can be the man, 
you can get high and get enough money back to cover the cost of the next package is the plan. This is the, what, what, what case management study would that be in sort of street business <laughs> <laughs> management? So the trouble is, who are you using? Who, who is going to bring you in a, you know, a package of heroin into the visiting room? What kind of person's going to do that? Sure isn't going to be your mom, right? They put pressure on girlfriends, don't they, to bring it in? Well, that's the only reason to have a girlfriend. <laughs> For most of these guys, seriously. <laughs> yeah, they even put pen pal ads out and, you know, pretend to fall in love with women. Well, the Christians, the Christians. Marry Christians women are, just to bring drugs in? Yeah, the Christians are the best ones. They get some 45-year-old fat Coke bottle, and pretty soon she's, uh, you know, key string the load and bringing it in, right? <laughs> So, so, where was I? You were talking about the guy, you were giving him 20, That's he was bringing it. back 30. It was Anyways, working out and it's going to go south. It did go south. So, of course, it's a dope fiend who's bringing in the package. She starts using the dope. It never makes it to the prison. The fellas, he didn't have his own money. He got them on fronts. He got the money on fronts to get the package, thinking he'd get it all done using other people's money. You know? <sighs> sort of pretty common experience in the world and sure enough he had to check in and so he was so basically i lost the last 20 but i made enough in vig so i came off just straight as is but it was a, it was another example of what how the business model in prison and can run into uh that, problems that's raised a few things in my mind then so there's like a jockeying of the users to try and be the one bringing it in, like you said. But sometimes the user can't get it out of their body. Did you ever see any situations <laughs> like that? Well, I wasn't that close to the, to the scene. Yeah. I mean, I tried to stay away from the drug thing because just how wild and crazy it is. I mean, yeah. The, here's, here's one that I got in and could have gone really bad, but fortunately it didn't. My uh, my crimey, he always carried a roll. So he had a roll of cash in his pocket. Is this pocket. Iron Mike again? No, this is uh, Phil. Phil. Phil always had a roll. And so this, this fella, Six Ways, he was a dope fiend. He came to Phil and he says, well, you know, can you break this hundred for me? He says, I, I'll, I need the, I haven't got with me, but I, I'll, you know, give me the five twenties and I'll go break it. And I saw him, I saw Phil give, which was our money, hundred dollars to this dope fiend. I thought, what the fuck are you doing? You know, this guy's a dope fiend. No, no. He's, he says, he's, I've done business with him in the past and it's always gone right. Same kind of way I was thinking too before in that last story. And so sure enough, a week goes by, six ways doesn't bring us back any money. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It just drags on. And so finally I say, we got to do something. This is bad. You know, again, company reputation. So. We arrange a meeting with him and he brings along one of these Nazi Peckerwood stalwarts, right? With the swastikas and all the tattoos and the, you know, bright and shiny blue eyes. And this guy, he, he starts on field. He says, you know, he says, any white boy that, that's selling, excuse me, I can't say that word, a uh, black time stamp, black dope. You know, doesn't deserve to be on the line, and uh, you know, a real white boy would have to check. He would check you into PC, and he's coming on hot and heavy, and he's staring at him and giving him the look, right? And so I thought, well, you know, this is this is heating up. So I was watching this, and finally they got to that point. So I stepped into the conversation, and I. I put my blue eyes on this uh, Peckerwood stalwart and I looked at Six Ways and I said, I said, Six Ways, I only got one question. Are you paying us or not? And he says, if I don't. And I said, well, I'm stabbing you. And that's where we left it. Now, if once, you, once you've done that, you sort of, you have to go through with it. If if it doesn't go your way. Fortunately, it went our way. He come back about an hour later with the money. But imagine if it hadn't gone our way. Imagine if they decided to call it. And then I had to run in on him. 
And then you don't know what's going to happen, right? And that's how dangerous the business is in, in San Quentin, because at the end of the day, that's where it is. There's no, you know, court tribunal to work out mediation. Just to let the public know how crazy it gets with the drugs then. So if you are the person smuggling the drugs in, in the packages, in your inside your body, or you've swallowed things and it's inside your body, then, and it's not coming out, well, like John described, the uh, the Nazis will show up at your cell, and if they're nice, maybe they'll give you blue thunder, which is a laxative, which may or may not work. If the blue thunder laxative does not work, then something is going in your ass. Either someone's hand or something is going to go in your ass to get those packages out because they are so desperate to get the drugs in and get high and make that money. Nothing will stop them, including the cavities of your body. That is not a barrier to these people. And another thing I saw, well, I didn't actually see it, but I knew it was, it was happening, is... Um, the people who had overdosed and were laid out and then it was about to be count because if a guard comes walking and sees someone laid out then the whole jail or prison is locked down which shuts down the you know the, the, the tattooing the drug business everything to prevent that the nazis will come along and shove ice cubes in your bum hole yes to try and shock you into waking up Whoa, that's getting a bit more intimate than I'd want to be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said you got a good story about the coolest gangster. Wow, well, it, this is uh, this surprised me. I was um, I was in the Sierra Conservation Center. I was with Phil, and we used to they they used to have a towel exchange every week. So you take your old towel and you go down to this towel room. And you exchange it for a new one. And the, it was, the towel room was run by the blacks. And they let you in two at a time. So Phil and I went into the towel room. And this black guy was behind the counter. And he took one look at Phil. And he did a double take. And stared at him. And then he yelled back, Yo, cue ball, get out here. And this black guy, of course you could tell why he was called cue ball, right? He called out and he said, what? And he said, man, he says, this man here, this man, the coolest gangster I ever seen. Now, I'm just stunned because this is a black guy telling a story to another black guy about a white guy in California prison. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely unheard of. And the black guy says, he's just a white boy. And this guy, he looks at cue ball and he says, he says, this man, he said, he went down to Red Dog's club on Bad Avenue. He said he walked into his club. He said he walked him out on the street, kneecapped him. He said Red Dog's crew come running out on the balcony screaming motherfuckers and shooting caps, popping caps. And he says, this man, he said, he just walked through that gunfire, didn't break a step, out to the old truck, one of these Marlboro man trucks, you know, shit kicker trucks. He said he opened the door, Pulled out a, a, a pump shotgun, boom, boom, boom. He said he blew all them brothers up. He said he blew them all over the balcony. And he said after he fired that third shot, he just turned around, walked back to his truck, threw in the sh shotgun, and drove away. <laughs> and he's staring at Phil like you staring at him like a kid just admiring, like if Superman had showed up or something, right? And he said, I'd never seen anything like it. And then he looks at Phil and he realizes where he, where he is and he says, hey, man, I'm sorry for fronting your shit like that, right? And Phil's by this time is getting real grumpy looking because, you know, this is not a story he wants spread around the yard, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know if it was true. I wasn't there. I never saw it happen. But because it was a black guy telling another black guy the story about something that he saw about a white guy, it had the ring of truth. <laughs> now, a lot of people talk about being gangsters and all the rest of it, but I don't, I don't call five adults rat packing some 15-year-old kid and stabbing him to death. I don't call that 
gangster. That's just the uh, man, that's straight up cowardly, right? I've got nothing else to say for it. So if you can lift your game up to where Phil's game was, then you can call yourself a gangster. But if you can't, don't even use the word. And I, I in that in that I include the Italians that go and you know, shoot some old friend from school in the back of the head in, in the restaurant, right? I don't, I don't call that gangster either, right? You calling out the Italian mafia, John? Well, I'm just saying, I don't call that gangster, right? <laughs> There's a level which, which I think you got to meet. And uh, anyway, so that's a, that's a secondhand story. So I can't swear up and down whether it's actually true. <laughs> Interpret that as you wish. So the old school Italian mafia had this code, don't harm women or kids. Now the cartels will talk to your entire family and put it on the online. Do you think that um, morals have gone from the, uh, you know, the old school gangsters days? It's the, well, I mean, it's, it, I tell you, it's interesting. In Japan, in Japan, they've got the Yakuza. And the Yakuza are way streaks ahead of the mafia or any other criminal organization. I mean, they operate like IBM or, you know, massive companies, like 20,000 members of uh, the Sumiyoshi Rengo or which other groups. And, and so they got 20,000 members, right? We're not talking, you know, six guys from the hood, right? And they're totally organized and they, their image is very important to them. And so they worked out a magic way of improving their image in society is they just bought up a movie studio toy pictures and the movie studio makes yakuza movies and the yakuza movies always are like the godfather you know the stalwart you know courageous this guy full of heart who protects you know the weak and you know revenges uh, things that have happened to his bros and the image of the yakuza because of this is pretty good i mean they actually went out and said the best way to improve our own image is buy a movie th movie studio and just produce good yakuza movies, bad yakuza movies where they're like good fellas and you just whack people for the fun of it, right? That they don't get made. Wow. And so, for like, if you're a gangster, it's pretty hard to say, you know what? I'm a heartless predator, and I'll just take what you've got and do whatever I want to you. And so instead of that. The guys come up with the stories, right? The, the gloss, the shoe polish on 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 the on the picture, and the story is, you know, I'd never hurt women and kids. Or I, the fact of the matter is, if a woman is there watching you whack somebody, she's going to, right? I mean, she's not going to be a, a witness in the court, right? And the same is true of anybody else. And so, it's more of a PR package, I think. I mean, I, like Escobar invested in. Some of his early films were him in the um, helping the homeless people and building homes for them and stuff like that. Yeah. So you told us that absolutely fascinating story about the Yakuza where the guy went on the kamikaze mission for them and, um, you know, he did that in public to show a show of strength. Well, that was when we were chatting afterwards, yeah. Did we not do that one on camera? No. Oh, can we do that one then, please? Oh, well. Well, as mentioning the Yakuza... <clears throat> Down in Osaka, which is this, this, the stronghold of the Yakuza, they're often involved in the real estate business and nightclubs, real estate development. And one of the things they do in real estate is, for example, this gentleman over here is a real estate developer. James. James, the real estate developer. And he wants to knock down this sort of you know, low-rent housing unit and build a big center. The trouble is there's a bunch of old grandmas and kids and migrants, people living there. So he's got a problem. So he talks to a friend and the friend contacts you and you're in the Yakuza. And so the boys go down and sometimes rotten fish heads are, you know, pushed through your door box. Uh, all night long, death metal, metal music is being played right outside your window. Uh, things start happening. And things just keep escalating until you move out. And so there's a connection with the real estate business. So these two Yakuza, they got unhappy with this real estate uh, president. And this guy hadn't given them, what he'd done is he'd used their services 
they would assumed they're getting 20, 30 percent of the biz, and he just you know threw him a few you know a few hundred a few thousand dollars and just said thanks for the help. And so they wanted to send a message. So what they did is they contacted the news media. Um, you know how some news stations chase crime news hotter than other ones do. So they chased those that, that chased the hottest. And they said, be down there at, at eight o'clock tonight for some really good video. So the, the news people went down at eight o'clock and they set the cameras up outside the real estate company front door. And at eight o'clock on the button, the two Yakuza came out of the real estate president's office with his head, holding his head for the camera Bloody hell. on TV. And they threw his head on the ground and they, they, they said, he didn't follow through with what he promised. And of course, the police came because this was on this was live on TV. So the police came, and the police almost arrested the TV crew because they said, "You know, what are you guys doing? You, you're almost you're complicit in this, right? How did you know?" And they said, "Well, we didn't know what he was going to do. He just said, be down there and see some good video,' and we got good video." <laughs> <laughs> so the Yakuza, knowing they were going to get busted, it didn't matter. The point is, there's twenty thousand of them. Now, the way it'll work is those guys who cut off his head, because the guys whose head they cut off wasn't a citizen as far as the police are concerned. Basically, in Japan, there's citizens, and then there are people who are in the dark world. And people who are in the dark world are prostitutes, gamblers, yakuza, um, money lenders, anyone in that, that scene. And then there's citizens who are everyone else. So there's a kind of an unwritten rule between the yakuza and the police. The police will not take so seriously things that happen in the dark world as long as it doesn't spill over into the real world of the citizens. So if the Yakuza go and kill a grandma with, with like, there's no drive-bys because that's just wild, crazy stuff that they won't put up with, the police won't put up with. But if they do cut off the head of some sleazy real estate prez, they might do 12, 15 years in prison. Now, when those two guys get out of prison, they'll become the bosses of a sub gang. They'll be given their own gang, and they'll have so many. They'll have a certain section of town with so many nightclubs, and so many uh, people working for them. Might have fifty people working for them, and they know this, and they know their future is secure. If they take one for the club, their future is secure, and because everybody knows. The future is secure. They don't have all this ratting that goes on in, in America, or probably Britain too, where you know everybody's standing in line waiting to snitch out their co-conspirators. In the, the Yagas, I have it down solid like that. So you know if you do your time and keep quiet, out you come, and you're taken care of. And you've, 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 you know, you've, you've, you made your bones, right? The head on TV, that does it, right? Tying that back to what we talked about earlier then, when they uh, did that crime then, and when they come out of prison, go back to the gang, they will be more highly respected, more feared, or both? Both. Both. But the most important thing is that the, the gang itself has a place for them. They become one of the, one of the, the, the sub-bosses. Because if you do that, if you... If you make a move like that for the gang, it means you're, it's 110%. You get, you'll give your life for the gang. And that's what they want. Loyalty is number one. The old sort of samurai code, loyalty beyond anything else. Yeah. And when you got that kind of internal solidarity in the group, the police have, they don't have a look in. So the Yaks have an interesting sy system with the police. So... For example, you're a sub boss and I'm a sub boss and, and I, I don't like you and you don't like me. So you whack me. And there's my dead body in the street. Now the police will come and they say, someone has to take this dead body. Now you don't want to fall for it. So you just look in your lieutenants and you say, get me a kid. So they look and they, they come up with Taro. And Taro's just got joined the gang. He's 19 years old. And he's eager and enthusiastic and wants to be a gang member. And you say, Taro, here's the gun. 
go into the police station and just tell him you did it. And Taro goes in to the police station. Here's the gun. I killed so-and-so at this time in this place. The police are happy. Now, the police in Japan, as your man, I think that fellow who went to Fuchu prison. Oh, yeah, BT. Yeah. I think he mentioned that the Japanese um, Crown Prosecutors, I mean, the Prosecuting Service conviction rate is 99.9%. So the police don't take any case unless it's a slam dunk. And so the kid walking in with the gun, I did it. That's, that's exactly where we want to be. The police are satisfied. The public is satisfied. There was a murder. There's an arrest. There's a conviction. And the gang is satisfied. They got where they want, where wanted to go. And with that kind of organization, that beats the mafia, that beats biker gangs, the cartel, anybody. Think about it. I mean, how many Hells Angels have, have, have ended up in the witness box fingering all their brothers or mafia members? What's it, John? Was it John Gotti? Did he end up? A, Sammy the Bull went against him. That's it, Sammy the Bull. You're, you're, yeah. you're another one of your uh, old friends from <laughs> podcasting world. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing good. He's got hundreds of thousands of subs now well, on he, YouTube, Sammy. He's, he's, he's a good storyteller. He's still alive, is the one. Yeah. They kept him alive in the witness program. I mean, I mean, wasn't he the guy who who was in the witness program and started a drug empire inside the witness protection. All right. So there's all kinds of controversy over this now. So when I was on the streets doing my ecstasy thing, people were saying they were working for him. And I met his son with wild man, the guards chained wild man to Sammy the Bull's son to see what, how, what kind of reaction there would be. And, um, so we knew that Sammy the Bull's son was, doing this ecstasy thing. But more recently now, Sammy the Bull's come out and said that he wasn't running the ecstasy thing. He doesn't know who I am. And um, I'm full of shit. And um, that's because trolls have contacted everybody from my past life to my prosecutor, Sammy the Bull, everybody, and said, you know, this Sean Atwood. How would anyone know who Sean Atwood is? I had so many aliases. The prosecutor said they couldn't even put them all, all on my grand jury indictment. I was just a shadowy person doing this thing, but my people on the streets were bumping heads with his people on the streets. The, well, let's call it the Gravano well, you're, Enterprise. You're, yeah. you're both saw an ecstasy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so he was the highest ranking member of the mafia to cooperate at that point in time because he was an underboss of John Gotti. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course, the reason is, is that they're given such huge sentences these days. In the 70s and the 60s, in the heyday of the mafia, mm -hmm. you, know, you kill somebody, you might do 10 years. And, you know, most things they're doing four, five, six, seven years. Yeah. And, you know, people could stomach that. They could, you know, and the same thing would work. If you, if you took one for the team, then, you know, you got a promotion. Yeah. But when you get into this new age of uh, 100 year sentences and double life, and, uh, that's, That's what sure. started breaking people down, yeah. wasn't it? And this, of course, why why they want to have that. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty easy to get people to cooperate if you can you know, threaten them with natural life term. Of course, yeah. So. Yeah. Your Yakuza stories are absolutely fascinating. Do you have any more? Well, I had a run-in with the Yakuza once myself. It was... Uh-oh. It's, actually, it's a respect story. Because... Um, <laughs> The Yakuza, they, they control the night world. And one of their most famous, probably the most famous celebration they have is at New Year's, Shogatsu. And the Yakuza like to go to the Shinto shrine at Shogatsu, right at the tick of New Year's. And they'd take all the bar girls and the nightclub owners and the money lenders and everybody in their world and you go to the Shinto shrine and you pray for good luck and fortune and don't get arrested and whatever. And it's kind of a thing for them, especially in traditional areas. And we also like would like to go at that time because you see all kinds of interesting people that you wouldn't see normally. Normally, Japan is very, you know, guys in suits, little mama-chans, kids, old people. It's very straight, very calm, very peaceful. But if you show up, at midnight, 
the New Year's at the shrine, Shinto shrine in the big city, then you get to see the other side, the dark world. So my friend, Ron, and this, my friend, he was a kindergarten teacher, okay? So we go together to see this. And we see the New Year's celebration and we hang around for a couple of hours. It's pretty cold. And we decide to come home. And so we're in this clapped out Mazda and we're driving the back road out of this, where the shrine was, down into a rice paddy. And we get about three quarters of the way across this narrow one lane road. And the other end, a sleek brand new black Mercedes pulls into the same, like, like for the same lane. Now, in Japan at that time, the only people who drove brand new, black, shiny new Mercedes were the Yasan, the Yakuza. And the reason they did it is they owned the Yanase, they owned the, uh, the Mercedes-Benz Importation Company. <laughs> So all the Yakuza members <laughs> <laughs> imported their cars <laughs> through the Yakuza uh, Mercedes-Benz importer. And I, I, I sort of thought I could see what was going to happen. He saw us and we saw him. And there was only room for one car to come down. And he was, he was at the end and he wasn't getting out of the way. He was just stopped there idling. And he was waiting for us to back up. And I'd have had to back up a couple of hundred yards on a narrow rice road, you know, at two o'clock in the morning after a few drinks. And I wasn't too keen on that, right? But I wasn't keen on it anyway for this respect thing because he was disrespecting us. And so I thought to myself, uh, you know, Yakuza, whoever, I, you know, I'm not... And so I drove straight towards him and he had the car kind of blocking the, uh, the entrance, but there was enough, well, there was kind of a bit of room. You, you might be able to slip by, but you're going to have to, uh, sort of, uh, damage his car a bit, right? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> so I slowly edge up to him and I look over at my kindergarten friend and I say, physical confrontation or car chase, your choice. And he's just looking at me, right? Being a good kindergarten teacher, he says, car chase. <laughs> so I pull up, up to the Yakuza car, and there's no way I can get by without taking off his paint. So I just <gasps> grind, I'm grinding down the side of his car, right? With this <gasps> clapped out Mazda. And I do the window down, and I said to him, Happy New Year. And just took the paint all the way down his car. Oh. And then sped off. Now, oh. speeding off in a clapped out Mazda, it's whatever. This guy's in a brand new Merc. He reverses and comes after us. And he's, I mean, he's got all the horsepower he needs to take us any way he wants to, right? Yeah. And Ronnie's looking worried, right? What's going to happen here? The Yakuza are after us, right? And we're racing around. And I, and I thought to myself, okay, what, what's a strong point of a brand new Merc? When you think of a brand new work, what are its strong points? The casing. The casing's heavy. Engine power. Engine power. It's fast, strong, good acceleration. There's no way I can run away from him. We get in a straight stretch, he has me. And I thought to myself, what's the advantage of a clapped out Mazda? You don't give a shit what, what you do with the car. It's uh, more maneuverable. It's easier to turn. And so I thought, I'm going to take this boy on a ride. So I took him in down these narrow country lanes. Now, you've got to go to Japan to see how narrow country lanes can get. Basically, it's the tires are right on the edge of the road, both sides. And I'm swishing and turning, twisting. He's right on me, though. He's got powerful lights. and he's. So I thought, how am I going to lose this guy? He'll chase me all night long, right? So I knew this, this uh, farmer. He, he's pissed off because people used to park on his on, on the side of it next to his house. So we put some great big stones about this big, one, two, three, four in a row. And so I thought to myself, this is our moment of truth. So I was racing down there and I did, I don't know what you guys call it. We used to call it a, Cal a California brake, right? And what you do is you don't hit the, you don't hit the foot brakes. You pull on the, 
the side brake. And I, and, and I just made a hard turn right into this narrow lane. But of course, he didn't see my brakes, brake lights come on. So he hammers into it, and this great big Mercedes badge, bam, into the stalls <laughs> on the other side of his car. <laughs> <laughs> and we just zip and turn and twist and of course i know this area really well and i don't know where he came from but he got lost and i sat up on the hill and watched him wandering around for a while and then he went home so <laughs> <laughs> so you were in japan for a while do you speak japanese yeah and um the stephen Beatty podcast then there was a story he told us that you had some details to add that's right do you remember in, in, in his story, he said that there was a, a rumor he'd heard that um, two prison guards had, had killed a prisoner, but he wasn't really sure and he didn't know if they hurt him or if they actually killed him. Well, that, that story he told actually is, is worse than he told it. Two prison guards killed three prisoners and the way they did it was diabolical. They tied them up in a straitjacket. They pulled down their pants and then they put a fire hose up their ass and just turned it on full pressure and it pulverized their intestines. But of course, here's the beauty of it. There are no bruises. There are no outside marks. And they, after the third one, they, they only got popped because statistically prisoners dying in Japan like that, uh, unknown causes is almost zero. So one, well, yeah, of course, two is you know, right on the edge. Three, somebody's dirty. So they got done for that. Can you imagine? What have they done to piss the guards off? Well, in, in the Japanese prison, I've never been to the prison. So if you listen to Mr. Beatty's uh, podcast, he can give you the details. But from what I know, you're not allowed to look at a guard. Looking at him is, is uh, dumb insolence. That's a violation. You're not allowed to sit down unless you're told to. You're not allowed to stand up unless you're told to. You can't walk. You're, you have to do this little run where they go everywhere. You can't stop working. You work until you're told not to. And so what probably happened is somebody, some prisoner might have you know, said, fuck you, or done, not done what he was told to, or looked at the guy, or who knows what the violation was. But the thing is, if you have absolute power over somebody, then what? The, the urge to like, you know, push it, the urge to go to the limit, it's, you know, it's almost inevitable that somebody's going to do that. Well, look at that experiment that they did with the prison guards and the, the actors started to get into it, didn't they? Well, it's, it's, um, it's part of being the human animal, I think. Um, I think, I think I mentioned about predation, weakness triggers predation. So if you're with a dog, if you see a strange dog and you're afraid and you start to back off or run, then the dog will bark and go for you. But if you come off strong and confident, the dog can smell that and he'll sit and look at you, watch you. Well, we're the same. We don't like to think that, but we're the same. So the human animal watches for weakness. And if you're a prisoner in that kind of condition where you, you're not even allowed to look at a guard and the guards control everything in your life, basically they can do what they want with you. If it's that strict then, how do the Yakuza like play the system or because imagine they've got the most play if if they're the local mafia in the japanese prison no system. because the the prison guards and the police despise the yakuza really? as individuals they just call them they the, in fact do you know what yakuza means no it um yakuza it's the it's the lowest the weakest hand in the game of hanafuda it's a japanese card game so you know how we have a full, like full house and, and a royal flush and a straight. Well, yakuza is the are the weakest cards you can have. So basically, calling someone a yakuza is means you have the weakest hand in society. You are the lowest animal in the stack as far as normal people are concerned. 
And the Japanese also, they, they look at them as uh, human trash. And so the Yakuza have turned that to their benefit. They say, you look at us as human trash, and that gives us, that's who we are, and we're going to be that human trash. We're going to put it right in your face. And so the, the police are hard with them once they get them, and the prison guards are hard with them. And so I think Mr. Beatty told a story about how one guy just whispered to him, isn't it cold today? And that was enough for them to get thrown in the cooler, right? Just, yeah. just whispering that. So it's a total control situation. Yeah. If you're watching this, then you want to watch BT's podcast, I'll put it in the description box. Um, it's world's strictest prison um, in Japan. So the Yakuza then, do they have, I'm curious about the structure. Do they have one boss or is it like, you know, a cartel has a number of bosses? How, how do they structure? It's, there's one boss. There has to be one there's boss. There's always one overall yeah. boss. Yeah. yeah. There has to be. Because otherwise you end up with, as, you know, internecine wars, you know, as, as the people fight it out to see. I mean, that's what happened to the, with, with Chapo Guzman, wasn't it? He was the cartel boss. And once they took him out, all this violence cracked off because then all the underbosses started fighting each other. Right? Yeah. And it was Escobar. It was what, what faction of the Medellin cartel, the, Car the Castaño brothers, that went after him in the end because he was cannibalizing his own um, associates. Yeah. And, you know, with the war on drugs as well, all the cops we've interviewed say that when you arrest a dealer or a boss, then everybody fights for that turf and all the underlings fight for that position and it just creates even more crime. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. As it would. Yeah. Yeah. So Yakuza's got one boss then, and then it just has various franchises underneath it. Well, there's big, there's about four or five big gangs that control the country. Four or five big gangs within the Yakuza yeah. or, or separate? Yeah, within the, in the Yakuza. Okay. And they're mostly regional. The Sumiyoshi Ringo and uh, there's, a, there's, there's, uh, it's gone down recently though, because, oh, let me tell you a story. This is an interesting story. This is from the bottom up. Um, I knew this guy, he was an artist, a Japanese artist, and he couldn't make any money as an artist. And so he opened a coffee shop across from a train station. And what he did was kind of, kind of clever. He, he's, he was like a barista and he sold this high quality coffee, but he turned the second half of the shop into like a mini art gallery of his art. And he talked to these ladies, mostly women, wife, housewives. And he'd chat with them and about coffee and this and that and gradually steer them towards his paintings and then sell them a few of his paintings. And this business was going on for about six months and it was, you know, he was quite pleased with it. And one day this guy walks in, this little Weasley guy, and the guy says, you need, uh, you need to buy five tickets to this concert. And they're $150 a piece. And he, has, and he has tickets, and it's a concert. And the guy says, well, I'm not interested in this kind of music. Thank you. And the guy says, well, it's really good music. You really should go. And he says, no, I'm not interested. That's fine. Thank you. So the guy disappears. And two days later, these three guys walk into the coffee shop early in the morning, sunglasses, black sweaters, black pants, black jackets. And then they take off their sunglasses. And then as each mama-chan comes into the coffee shop to get her coffee, they just stare at her. They just stare at her. They don't say anything. They don't do anything. They paid for their coffee. And she gets uncomfortable and leaves. And they're there all day long. And they leave 5 o'clock when he closes. They don't threaten him. They don't say anything to him. And this goes for three days and he, he doesn't know what to do. He phones the police. He says, there's these strange guys in my, in my coffee shop. And the police says, well, what are they doing? He says, well, they don't do anything. They just drink coffee and sit there. And he, the police says, well, so what? And he says, yeah, but they're, they're, they're frightening my, my customers. And he says, well, what do they say to them? Nothing. What do you mean you're frightening? They don't say anything to them. And 
And then about, about a week later, the same Weasley guy comes in with the tickets. And he says, the concert, I still have some tickets for you if you're interested. And suddenly the, co the coffee shop owner is interested. And he never sees the other guys again. Now think about that. There have been no threats. There actually is a singer doing a concert. The tickets, what's the price for a ticket, right? I mean, you could easily, how much do they charge nowadays to go to a live concert? How much oh, is Glastonbury? I don't know. Hundreds of pounds, isn't yeah? it? Yeah. So think about that scare. How are you going to nail the, the Yakuza for that? Now they control, they collect money, at least when I was there, from all bars, all restaurants, all nightclubs, any kind of gambling, pachinko center, anything like that, even from coffee shops that some artist sets up outside the train station. Now just imagine the money you're making. That's just, that's not even, that's, I, what would you call it, protection? Yeah. But it's so much smoother than the old mafia story. Insurance. It's so smooth that. <sighs> well, they go with baseball bats and break your arm. Well, yeah. I mean, can you imagine? What are you going to? What's the pros what's, what's the prosecutor going to say? What are the police going to say? There's nothing to say. So you give a structure of one boss and then five regions. Well, there's many regions, but so does each each region. I assume then has a regional boss. Well, inside each gang, so each gang, it's like a it's like a company organization. The Japanese are very structurally organized. There's the oyabun. Oyabun is the the boss, and then there's the different levels of gangster underneath them. And the lowest level are the the chimpira, the wannabes, and they're the ones that sort of you know causing trouble at the street level did um you see the tattoos of the yakuza do you know what they mean oh, <laughs> well i mean they have the, they have the best tattoos in the world it's an art form really yeah easily it's an art form i mean we're not talking you know supreme white power stamped on your forehead we're talking giant big dragons and cherry blossoms and samurai swords and everything you can imagine and they take it seriously. So the thing is, one a guy I know, uh, he, uh, he's a liver surgeon, works in a hospital. And we once got on the topic of the Yakuza, and he said, don't worry about the Yakuza. I said, what do you mean? He said, they're all dying. I said, what do you mean? He said, they all, they all get liver cancer and die. I said, he says, I see them every day. He says, the, he says the combination of the, of the shooting speed, the tattoos, and all the heavy drinking, they just burn their livers out. Hep C. So there's a downside. But uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance, those Japanese tattoos, it's, look at an album. They have albums of the uh, Yakuza tattoos. They're pretty impressive. I'll have to Google some of that. Wow. Okay. So the next subject then, how the relationship of predator and prey works out in prison and outside well i've got a question for you actually because i watched one of your um uh, youtube casts it wasn't yours you were doing a ted talk oh yeah yeah and in your ted talk you described how four guys just beat the pulp out of you somewhere now, oh me yes no one guy attacked me that oh, it was, was one guy wasn't yeah it? yeah yeah so my question is what set him off what my cellmate so I'm a fish. No, this wasn't a cellmate. This is on the street. Oh, oh, you're on about that. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what, what set that off? Because you know, okay. I just said that there's there's always a moment, a moment of weakness that somehow sets off predation. What was so it? So here's the thing. This, yeah, this is an interesting one. It ties into what we've been discussing. So I was a young person, just going out to fill my mum's little red car with petrol. I've just got my driver's license, and there was some drunks like um, rugby player size lads in the 20s. And they started getting abusive towards me. And I thought it was brave to stand up to them. I think I've watched too many Rambo movies around that time. <laughs> I just got my weightlifting set in the garage. So that, that, that was a massive lesson to me to not to go up against um, four people who are considerably bigger than me. Because I that this is why I've got these nice teeth right here. They knocked 
bottoms of my teeth out of an iron bar. So I've got these veneers on the front right here. Well, an iron yeah, bar yeah. is sort of taking it past what you'd expect for drunks in the street. Yeah, yeah. So it was just, do you know, do you remember, do you remember what, like, how you were dressed or how you were carrying yourself or what I was set dressed it off? Like, I was dressed like a raver, probably, because I was starting raving. And that was the car that me and Wildman used to go across the country to our raves in. And um, they were just gobby looking for trouble, hooligan types. And I should have just got the fuck out of there. I shouldn't have said anything. Yeah. Well, I can remember when I came here in, in 87 after I got deported. The one thing you didn't do on the street is be hanging around when pubs close. Yeah. Because all the young guys come out of the pub just geared and ready for action, ready to just get into it with somebody. Yeah. And if you're there, they'll find a reason to get into it with you. It was exactly that mindset. And then they were like a pack on me then. Because once they got me on the floor, that was it. All I could do was get into the fetal position. And you just feel the blows hitting you. But the weird thing was, the, the adrenaline thing, um, my eyes are closed. And I thought they'd stop hitting me because I couldn't feel the blows anymore. So I opened my eyes and they were still hitting me. And I couldn't understand how I couldn't feel the pain. And then you start seeing the stars and then you just go. You just mm. go, don't you? They smashed my car windows and everything. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a terrible story. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Because I had anxiety as a teenager anyway. So then going through that shook me up even more. But then I felt safe. Was it when I was on ecstasy and other drugs? Then oh, it, yeah. it made my stress go down. That was Superman pills. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about predator and prey. So yeah, you know, I was the prey in that in that case. Well, here's a story where I was the prey. Okay. I'm on escape, and I'm in San Francisco, and I go up with my friends to Coit Tower, a nice part of San Francisco, to a nice restaurant, and have a lovely dinner. You know, kind of drunk. And I full stomach, and I thought, oh, I'd like to go for a walk. I mean, I need to walk. This is just sitting around. And so, and San Francisco's nice at night, right? So I went for a walk, and I'm wandering along and just in my own mind, floating a bit. And I'm, I'm sort of dressed like a tourist. I got a white, white shirt, white chino pants, white socks, white shoes. I'm looking mighty white, right? And I wander, without knowing it, I've wandered across Van Ness into the next neighborhood. And it all looks the same. It's all dark and, you know. And up ahead I see, I think I see a statue and there's a few trees. It's like the end of some little park or something. So I thought, I'll just walk over there and see, see who the statue's for and then I'll turn around and come back home. So I walk up and there's nobody around. And I walk past the entrance to the park and I walk in. And as I walk in, I can see the statue here, and there's a big black guy sitting on a park bench right here by himself. And I see a flash of movement in the corner of my eye, and another black guy has followed me in from behind. And then as I'm walking towards this guy who's on the bench, I see another black guy come from behind the statue, and I realize. They've got me. It's midnight. I'm by myself. There's three of them and they're blocking. And obviously they've done this how many times before because they had each point that I could have tried to escape from blocked off. And I stepped right into it. So, I mean, this is a bad situation. I mean, and who knows what could happen because not only is it just they're going to rob you for sure, but who knows how much time they did in prison and a good chance to just smash up some white guy in the street and nobody around. And there's no CCTV cameras or anything like that. So the guy on the bench is just sitting there and these guys are, they haven't made their run for me yet. They're just kind of closing in. And so just as the, the guy on the bench starts to stand up, I slipped this five shot 38 snub nose that I had in my pocket oh, and I just showed it to him. I just showed him. I didn't say anything to him. I didn't break a stride, just showed it to him. And he just sat back down on the bench 
And this guy just instantly took a cue off his sitting back down on the bench and went back around the statue. And the other guy just did a turn and went back out the park. <laughs> no, I can tell you, Sean, I'm a pretty good shot at two yards. <laughs> Wow. Have you got any stories of, from the California prison system then of, well, this of is, prey? What I wanted to tell you about this in terms of prey is that I was prey as I walked in. They saw me. They had me. They were just on the moment of, of springing the trap, the three hyenas. And then suddenly I showed them my claws. And all of a sudden I'm not prey anymore. I'm a predator too. And, and just on that switch. That's how fast it can happen. Just on that switch, they they just back down and sat. Because, of course, San Francisco is a party town. And I suddenly realized as I was walking back that there's hundreds of people like me wandering around the streets who don't know the city, don't know where they are, have wandered into some, you know, ghetto area without knowing. And San Francisco's bad that way. You can just walk across Van Ness a couple streets over and suddenly you're in some, you know. I remember going there in the 90s and... Um... I was on acid actually, and we were going up and down those little roads, like it was like the Big Dipper. Yeah. And then a cop pulled us over, and um, Acid Joey was driving. We were all off our faces and a car full of drugs. And it was the coolest cop in the world. He goes, God damn it, you're going down one way street, you're from Arizona, you fucking idiots don't know, you know? Turn that car around and get going that way. He'll just let us go. Well, San Francisco has a rule is that it's a party town. Yeah. A convention party town. So the police are told, do not mess with the conventioneers and the party goers and the really? sort of good timers. Yeah. So you're a good timer, so they don't mess with you. Yeah. The people they mess with are the are the sort of the hyenas mm -hmm. and the jackals who are preying on the tourists <clears throat> yeah. and the conventioneers. So it's a kind of a different place than LA, for example, which is, you know. It was crazy on the streets. The Third like, Reich. It was like. A lot of homeless in one area. There was a lot of sex workers in another area, and a lot of hippies in another area. And it was just, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it is. Just... Interesting, though. Interesting atmosphere. Yeah, it's a lively place. We, yeah. we used to call it Sci-Fi City. Really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um... As in terms of prey in prison, well, here's a story where I was a straight-up predator, and the only time I ever did this, but anyway, so I'm in Vacaville. I've just come back from escape and I'm walking out of the, the building and I'm with Doug Orr, that Hells Angeles. Oh about. yeah, Doug. Doug and I'm, and there's an Indian kid and somebody from my county, about five people around him. And he's like, he's the man, you know, do you know how in the old days, um, there'd be some famous warrior who'd earned his bones and he was the man. And the young men would want to be around him because they wanted to be like him and learn from him and you know that kind of thing. Like Uhtred in the last kingdom. Yeah, that's and so that's how it, that's how it works. And he was the man. And so we walk out to the yard, and he pats his pockets and he says, "I don't have any smokes. Anybody got any smokes?" And nobody had any smokes. So I said, "We'll take care of it." So I started walked out onto the savannah right and this indian kid now i didn't even know his name i didn't know anything about him he just just automatically joined me like the second hyena <coughs> and we walked out on the plane and i just cast my eyes just like one of those nature shows just looking at the other animals for anything for a sign for some sign and there were like all these kids guys dressed in their prison greens sitting you know here and there on the grass and as I walked past this one group, I saw a flash of red as this guy, he just the corner of his Marlboro carton, he was hiding under his coat. And that was the signal. That was that sign of weakness, that moment when, you know, as, as the predator, you know, that's the prey. Because the fact that he was trying to hide it, if he just had it right out there in the open and just looked at me, who knows? But he tried to hide it. And so without even working out a plan with this Indian, it's like he was just in sync with me exactly. Jesus. So I walked, I made sure I walked out of the sun on this guy. So the sun's up behind me. 
I walked out of the sun and I said to him, you know, you owe a carton on that joint my, my bro here uh, sold you. And the Indian instantly nods, right? And the guy, and the Indian makes a move this way. The guy looks towards him and I reach over and grab the carton out, out from under his jacket. He jumps up, I throw the cart into the Indian, I looked at the guy, and I said, get down or give up. He gave up. And he gave up. Now, it was unfair because most of the guys were on reception. Now, that was the reception center. What that meant was that a lot of people went there who were, they'd been sentenced the sentence was dependent on their diagnostic report from the prison. And so the sentence might change if they got a good report or go bad if they got a worse report. Now, it could be that this guy, um, uh, you know, was worried about his, how things would look if he got in a brawl in the yard. But the critical, the critical moment was, you know, get down or give up. And he gave it up. And so I walked back with the Indian and I went with the carton and we broke it open, handed around the cigarettes. And Doug looks at me and he says, what about you? I said, I don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a, t of a story too. Tony's told me then were on the rec yard. This was like back in the seventies or eighties. ABs are all strong. And they took, um, I don't know if it was the jeans and trainers of someone on the rec yard and he just gave them up. And to Tony said from that moment on, because everybody saw that from that moment on, that guy's reputation was just ruined. Yeah, he was done. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. this guy actually that I took the cigarettes from, he wasn't as heartless as it, as it seemed because about an hour later, I was on the weight pit doing bench presses and I glanced over and he was on the edge of the weight pit pretending not to look at me. Now, that's another tell. If you're pretending not to look at me, then I know you've got evil in your heart. And somehow I just knew that. So it was the same Iron Mike. He was my spotter. I said, Iron Mike, I said, there's this fella, see him over there? He said, on the edge of the pit? I said, when he starts walking towards me, just give me the, just give me the nod. And of course, the kid wasn't as gutless, and he was waiting for me to do a bench press, and then he'd catch me and do me up good. You know, all he has to do is just lift the weight and throw it on my neck, and I'm done. So just as he commits to his move, he's halfway across the pit, I stand up and walk over to him, and I said, I'm having bad thoughts about you. Don't ever think about that again. And he just looks at me, turns around and walks. <laughs> so it's a fine line, isn't it? Because like you said, if you do get in a situation, you're going to extend your sentence, but you, you've got to stand up for yourself or you're going to get punked. So how do you know where to balance well, that? Well, this is, this is the thing. This is what's so difficult about it because you have to play it right on that edge where they believe that you're going to go. They believe what you say, but you really don't want to be in slashing people to death with knives because if you don't get caught with the blood on you, you're going to be given up for sure by the other prisoners because there's just, you know, they can take that story to the security lieutenant and get a transfer to minimum security or they might even get a few years off with the parole board. And there's always someone who'll, who'll jump at the chance. So the downside is so great that you sort of, it, it's a difficult little line you have to play, but you try to be right on that line. Did you ever see that video um, about these two Bushmen? And they had, this, they had this scam where they would rob lions of their food. Robbed lions? Yes. No. Well, this is amazing video. It's on YouTube. <laughs> These two guys, and they're middle-aged. One of them is like an old guy. He's like, you know, like 55 or something, right? And the other one is like about 30-something, 30 38. And they're just, and they've got these little toy, the Bushmen use these little toy bows about this big. I mean, they've got some little poison tip to them, but that's not going to, you know, kill the lion before he tears you to bits, right? 
So these guys saw, they just watched the birds, and they see where the lion had made a kill. And so they just stand up and walk straight for the pride. And there are about eight lions at the kill. And just walk straight for them, like they haven't got a fear in the world. Holy shit. And the lions, each lion just backs away suddenly, like, what the fuck, what's going on here, right? And the lions back up. And they got a window of about 30 seconds. The guys just walk to the, to the kill, take their knife, cut off a leg, throw it on the leg and walk. And in that 30 seconds, the lions are kind of looking to see what's going on. Are there any more of these humans? What, what's happening? Um, they're starting to start growling. And in those 30 seconds, they got this window to do their thing and escape. And then the lions get their courage back and they all come rushing in and they see the meat still there. And so they just attacked what's left, which is most of it. And these guys walked away with a whole haunch of a big antelope. And they were unarmed, essentially. Unarmed. And any, any one of us would look like Arnold Schwarzenegger compared to these little skinny bushmen. Wow. Now you understand watching that, how human beings, being as weak and soft as we are, why we took over the planet and they didn't. It, it really is. You, get, you should watch that one. If you Do you know that. what the video title is? It'll be Bushmen Robbing Lions or something like Bushmen that. Bushmen Robbing Lions. <laughs> People are going to be all over that. So you've got some questions come in then. And... Um, There was a video I put up a couple of days ago. I think it was California prison shank story, something like that. One of the clips from your podcast one. And someone's asked, why was the Chicano kid rolled up after doing his expected duty? Do you remember that story? Is that yeah, too? But um, well, he's, he's just stabbed a guy in the back right in front of the guards. Why is he rolled up? Of course he's rolled up. I mean, he's committed an offense right in front of five prison guards. So he's going to get done. Yeah. So he got rolled up for sure. Okay. I mean, he's a, I, I felt for that guy because he, he basically got pushed into that by the Mexican, uh, by the uh, Chicano, uh, gang. And he was, he only had short time to do. He was like mm. walking within a year or something, right? Kamikaze mission. But it's that rule, you know, the Chicanos really take that stuff seriously more than the blacks do and more than the whites do. And there was no wiggle room for him. If he didn't do it, then he wasn't, he was a punk. And who knows where it would have gone from there. So personally, he could have finessed it, I think, but he didn't. Putting the knife right through the guy is the wrong move. All he had to do was attack him, you know, whack him in the head with a tray or something. Then he goes and does 30 days in the, in the lockup. And, you know, he's got his respect. He did something. But to put, the, put a knife right through a guy, right in front of the guards, another seven years, whatever. If you want to learn more about the Chicano gang rules in California, see our video that went up recently with the rapper, Mr. Capone. Um, he really lays it down what the politics are in California prison with the gang members and all the different gang structures so that was from lucky lou so thanks for that question lucky lou so matty b has asked how the fuck can a vegan survive in a tough nut prison well you'll see i gave you some canadian stories and in one of those canadian stories is um uh, an interesting tale in canada unlike the united states the prisoners actually have some rights and they have rights for the same reason that they do in, in England to a certain extent is that, you know, there are rules and if that's the rule, that's the rule. The guards just can't, you know, whack you on the head and make you wear pink pajamas or whatever <laughs> what they did. <laughs> Sheriff our <Sheriff> Joe. <laughs> but so what happened was they, I read in a, in a, in the, one of the prison magazines that they had there that, They'd introduced vegetarian diets for uh, religious groups because there were Sikhs and different people who didn't eat meat and such like. And I don't want to eat sloppy joes, you know, 
whatever grade X hamburger meat and with some muck. And I thought to myself, well, vegetarian food is where I want to be. And so I read this and I thought to myself, well, what's this religious side? And of course they're thinking of the Muslims and the Sikhs and Hindus or whoever else like that. Because in, in Canada, there are quite a few Sikhs. But I thought to myself, I should go down this road. So I declared myself to be a Buddhist. <laughs> I declared myself to be a Buddhist and I went to the priest and you had to go to this priest to get him to sign your religious requirement uh, uh, document. And he just laughed at me and told me to piss off, right? Uh, he was a hardcore Roman Catholic. He used to belong to, um, they were called the White Fathers. And they, they, they worked in Africa, the deepest Africa, for decades and decades. And it kind Snatch, of, snatching kids. Yeah, it does things to you, you know. And so he told me that. So I had to go through the, the, the Canadian uh, grievance system. The, the prisoners can have a first-level grievance and a second-level grievance. And you know how it goes. It churns through the system. But I've got, I just got time anyway, so I go through it. And out of the blue, I'm completely amazed, but at third level grievance, the guy gr agrees. Some bureaucrat stamps and says, yeah, he can be a Buddhist. I thought to myself, great. So I went down to the, uh, the priest again, showed him my granted three, third level grievance. And he just, I put it on the desk. He just knocks everything on the floor and tells me to piss off again. <laughs> so I just wrote down exactly what he did. And I put in another grievance, mentioning him by name and exactly what happened. And about a month later, he's, he, he disappeared. And um, this young kind of Anglican, kind of with it guy shows up and he, he instantly agrees. He stamps my paper, accepting me as a Buddhist. Because by this time, I got one Buddhist book and put it on my bookshelf just to, you know. Because they'd search your cell, by the way, to see if you actually have any practicing uh, materials in your cell. I um, did the similar thing, converted to the Hindu. But the, the, they didn't know what questions to ask me about the Bhagavad Gita, so they just gave it me automatically. Well, the, this time I had a, I had a book just so that there'd be something, and the priest saw the book. And so they stamped it, and then I had to go down to the kitchen supervisor and say I wanted a, a vegetarian diet. And he'd been one of these Canadian Army vets from in the kitchens for like 40 years, and for him it was all sloppy joes and what's wrong with shepherd's pie and, you know, who are you? And But I, I had this grievance and I had all the paperwork, so they didn't know what to do. So I, they said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, uh, I don't know, a cheese souffle and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and some everyday, some bananas and apples and oranges and, and uh, you know, some tofu and maybe, even, mm. and I just, just, just gave them a whole list of stuff. Well, they started giving me this great vegetarian diet and the guys, they'd see me sit down with all this fresh fruit and, you know, this, the, and they could look at this slop and the jello they've got, right? And pretty soon there's a lot of Buddhists. The, the religion really flourished at that point. So that was in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Spence. Did John's time inside make him change in any way? Or did he go back to his illegal ways once released? Well, I, I think I mentioned in the first video that basically out of, in my crew, Dead, dead, life sentence with another life sentence, and natural life. So, and, you know. There goes your pay group. Uh, and in my future, with my record, I mean, it was, you know, you're going to get, I'm, I'm going to get, uh, what's that called, that IP or, you know. IPP, yeah. Yeah, I'll get that instantly if I was, if I was in for some violent beef, you know. Yeah. So, at some point. What did Kenny Rogers say? You know, know when to hold him and know when to fold him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I sort of differ from a lot of guys because I don't, I don't worry about w if what I did was good or bad or whatever. I think it was natural. I mean, I think it's human instinct and I think that's part of being the human animal. And to simply say the human animal doesn't do that or anyone who does that's a psychopath. I think that's taken the easy way out. And this is who we are. And if we given if if things trigger, 
You remember we were saying about predation getting triggered by weakness. So I'll give you an example down on the south coast. This happened a couple of years ago. This, this old lady, she's demented, 85 years old. She comes wandering out of the rest home in her pajamas. And she wanders downtown. And she walks up to this 25-year-old Romanian illegal. Oh, he wasn't illegal if he's Romanian. That's EU, isn't it? So he's legal. She walks up to him and starts babbling or something, muttering, asking him something, but it doesn't make any sense. He, she drags her into the back of the bank behind the dumpster and rapes her. Mm. Now, it was all under CCTV, right? But for me, this is an interesting case because you know this guy was not wandering around town looking to rape somebody. He just was walking along when someone who was completely helpless and completely weak and is, could do nothing. And this is a case where weakness triggers predation. And the same thing's happened up north. I remember there's some cases where some woman stumbled out of a pub, mini skirt, completely drunk, fell out in an alley. Some guy raped her. And she stumbled down the street, flagged down a car. He got out, raped her again. Another, one, another guy raped mm. her. And these guys are not, you know, they're not cruising around town looking to rape people. They're just, they're, that trigger, complete helplessness. But you would describe them as opportunists. I think it's just, it's the, it's the, the predatory instinct that we've all got and it gets triggered. I mean, you were a predator at one time too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember, um, what, what I'm talking about, but. As a drug trafficker, you'll be classified as a predator. No, I, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Well, you were a predator because you were cold calling people, selling stuff. I was a stockbroker. <laughs> that, that is straight stop up. Stockbrokers are bigger predators than drug <laughs> traffickers. Hey, those, those guys are straight up predators because if you cold call somebody and some sucker actually answers the phone and starts talking to you about stocks and shares, you know he's ignorant and naive and a sucker and you got him. 500 numbers a day, baby. Nobody talks to cold callers. 10 people stuff. will take your, take your call out of that 500. <laughs> and out of that 10, one might do a transaction numbers yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. So, and exactly like Wolf of Wall Street. That's how we were trained so in the beginning. You, you, you had your moment as a predator too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and it's, I don't know about you guys. You ever enjoyed a bit of predation? Yeah. You know? So, door to door. I think it's door to door, but that's, Quite mild, uh, well, no, they, I mean, to do it successfully door to door, you catch the old people, you give them a bit of the chat, you know, you can see they don't really know what they're talking about, then you lead them into it. I always believed in the products I was selling, so I didn't believe myself as taking yep. advantage. But a, any salesman no will response, tell you, James. any salesman will tell you that when you're a salesman, you're selling yourself. That's what you're really selling. Mm. And the product really doesn't matter. How about you? No? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> Never been tempted when some girls knocked out on booze? And oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look how good looking Joe is. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. <laughs> here's one for you. Here, here's, here's You're going to get trolled over that remark. Here's one of your <laughs> morality questions. There was a guy that I knew. He was a member of our tip in San Quentin. And he called himself Psycho. And There's always a Psycho, isn't there, on the other, or a yeah. Diablo? Yeah, he called himself Psycho, <laughs> and he had these kind of blurry youth authority tattoos, fuck you, on his hands. And he was a speed freak, right? He was about 26, mid-20s, but he looked about 46, you know? And this guy, he was a biker, and his bros at the clubhouse told him they wanted some girl to party with. It was party night. So he drove his hog down to the nearest bar, cold cocked the best looking bitch sitting there, threw her over his shoulder, took her to the clubhouse and they all ran a train on her. Oh, Jesus Christ. Now, he, <sighs> he would tell this story with pride. And he said, I had to cop to illegal confinement and uh, assault. Aggravated assault and illegal confinement oh. to avoid the rape beef. Oh. But the point is, he was walking the main line and he had no shame about telling people this story. 
And as far as I could see, from what I knew of bikers, that's how bikers did their thing. It, it was no big thing. That's how they lived. Now, you're sort of pretty active in this, you know, the Chomo discussion and such. Yeah. How do you guys see that? If he had a sex offense of any kind, from where I was, and from most of the people I've interviewed, he would have been attacked or something bad would have happened. Well, you see, this is the thing. He didn't actually come to this joint with a sex beef. He came okay. with he came with illegal with unlawful confinement and aggravated assault because he pled out. Yeah. And what year what what year was that then? Back in the eighties. It had been nineteen seventy eight, somewhere. Seventies. Right yeah, I think the code has changed since then. But if he didn't have paperwork on a sex crime, he might have got a pass. Well, for us, I mean we didn't we didn't think of it one. I mean, for me, I just thought that's how bikers were. It wasn't mm. didn't strike me as particularly strange. Yeah. So now listening to, you know, them talk about who's a chomo and who's not. Yeah. I mean, for me, a child molester is exactly that. Someone who hangs around the, the schoolyard trying to jump little kids. Yeah, but a rapist of a woman is equally KOS. Well, you see, this is the thing. Look at that Julian Assange case. Yeah. What was he? He got accused of rape because he had sex with the woman once, and then later in the middle of the night, he had sex with her again, but he didn't expressly ask her, do you want to have sex? And so apparently under Swedish law, that's rape. Because he didn't wear a condom. Was that the reason? That's the law, yeah. Yeah, but that woman was seen with Julian partying with him and getting photos of him. Well, she was in bed with him, slept with him, and they had yeah. sex already, already once. So it was that. That was just like a setup. Well, that's what I'm saying. So is Julian it, gets a pass because the whole world, well, the majority of people believe that was just you know orchestrated by the Clinton crime family or something like that because he or everything he exposed about what was going on in America, collateral murder, that video. I guess my point is that it the goalposts seem to have moved a little bit. Because Psycho was walking the line, and, and not only was he walking the line, but he yeah. would proudly tell the story. He had yeah. no problem with it. Well, as you're talking, you know, Jimmy Savile era, so now th things have completely changed. Um, I, I got to tell you the, the rest of the, the Psycho story because yeah, yeah. no one else is going to test tell it, so I will. <laughs> so I got out of prison, and we suddenly got a phone call from this woman and she was in tears and she said, Ronnie's dead. And I said to my crime partner, I said, well, who's Ronnie? And we, you know, he, he talked to her some more and it turned out Ronnie was psycho. We didn't even know his name. I think the viewers are rooting for a good end to psycho. Anyway, well, it, and she said, well, she said, he's, he's, you know, he said you were his best bros and we, I don't know how he happened. And, and you got to find out what happened because he would never kill himself because the word came that he'd killed himself. So we went on a mission. We, we decided to look into this. And we found out that he'd been working. This was, his, this was his parole job. He was a tester in a meth lab. So as soon as the, the, new, the new trays of crystal meth would come off the cooker, he would test them to see how good they were, if it was poisonous or not. So we go over to this meth lab in the Placer Hills near Sacramento. And we walk in and Phil, he knew the guy. He, Phil had been in the business, you know, meth labs and all that. And the guy, the first thing he does is pull out a gun, which is sort of an exciting thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> he pulls out a gun and he's playing with it. And he says, do you know what this is? And Phil says, yeah, it's a, it's a 380 automatic been underpowered and he just tosses the gun to Phil. I mean, with these speeders, you just never know what they're going to do, right? And so at that moment, he tosses the gun and suddenly from right over here, from this open doorway, somebody throws a Bowie knife and it comes hurtling past my head and bam, bangs into the wall and falls down a knife. And I just pull up my pistol. And I draw down, I'm just about to shoot somebody. And it was this woman and she's just shaking and screaming and muttering and shaking. And the, and the meth lab guy, he, sa he says, he says, don't, don't shoot her. He says, it's my wife. She's been up three days. <sighs> Give her a pass. So that's the only time I ever get close to shooting a woman, right? And 
so finally we the, all the this drama calms down right and we ask what happened to psycho and it turns out he he tried a new batch and then just ate his shotgun and uh, i said well where is he then and they said oh he's down in the well we tossed him we couldn't call the coroner you know so so he's down the well so there you go you got your what the ending that psycho deserved um in the viewer's eyes so we went back and we saw the girl and we gave her some speed that, you know we got from this guy as a sort of a consolation prize right and that is the end of psycho <laughs> as we say vaya con dios <clears throat> Was John affiliated to any gangs? So, my understand. Well, you come under the control of the main white gang, don't you? But your affiliation is well, I, not. I wasn't in the AB or you know the Nazi lowriders or anything like that. I didn't, so you were independent. Yeah, independent with my own little group. After a while, right? Yeah. But you've got to kind of like get along with the the, the guys, haven't you, somehow? Or well, the thing is, it's pretty easy to get along with the guys when you're selling speed on the line, right? Yeah, of course. There's a saying, whoever controls the drugs controls the prisoners, or whoever controls the food controls the prisoners. In your case, whoever controls the TV guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is with the, with, the, with the speed thing is that people just come up and offer their services. Yeah. And they'll kill someone for fucking hundred dollars yeah. worth of heroin. You know, I mean, this is how we got to know Psycho because he was a good guy to know because he was a good white dog. He was a biker, so he instantly knew all the bikers. And if he could arrange a deal from them to us, then we give him a taste, and he get a taste on the other end. And he was as happy as could be. He was like a loyal dog, right? Yeah, yeah. And pretty soon there were all these guys around, and they were just happy to do things for you. So it wasn't as if, you know, there's no, this is why I don't really take all this gang stuff too seriously because seeing how it actually plays out, you know. Did you ever get any conjugal visits? I did, yeah, in Canada, finally. It, uh, there was uh, this drug dealer I knew. Um, he... He was an importer, hash importer from Lebanon. And he was one of these guys who got busted, but he didn't get, what's the expression, de assetized or have, didn't have his assets uh, for a away. civil for assets forfeiture. He didn't have any of that because they didn't have it in those days. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so he was still in position. And so he decided that, you know, he thought that, it, that I was in a bit of a hard go going all these years without female uh, contact. So. He arranged for some woman to come up and we sort of started visiting and pretty soon she's, uh, I got married to her and we're on the, she's on my list. And, wow. And you get three days in the trailer and we call it the boneyard. Three right? days? Three days in the trailer. Holy shit. Yeah. I mean. How often can you get the three days? It's like once every six months or something. Once every six months. But still, three days in the trailer, that gives you something to look forward to. Yeah, imagine. Yeah. By the time I worked my way down to minimum, I was allowed a food visit every six months. <laughs> That's what I had to look forward to. Well, the trouble is you went... <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason that Canada's got stuff and, and that California doesn't is because the California prisoners are just bone stupid. Mm. I mean, this race stuff is just so dumb. Mm. I mean, the prisoners should be fighting the man, not other prisoners. And because they fight each other, they don't get anything. They get treated like rabid dogs. And they just get put in little tiny rabid dog cages with nothing. Keeps them divided. Now, in Canada, I went, I think I mentioned the Matsqui prison riot. The prisoners just totally wrecked the prison, burned it down. They spent a year in the tent city. But once they built the new cell block, all of a sudden, the prisoners got the most liberal setup of any prison in Canada. Mm. And they had things called socials. Now in a social, like some group would put on a social and you could bring in your visitors from the street and have a dance in the gymnasium wow. with like live music, wow. speakers, right? And live music, a live band could come in and people could dance and then you could sit around and have you know picnics and all the rest of it. And the reason was because 
In Matsque, they had a volatile young population. They were all the medium security young punkers who weren't trying to make a name for themselves. And these guys had tear the prison up just on, you know, a pruno batch. You know, everybody gets high and let's just do it. And so the guards, the, the, the warden, he was a smart guy. If you want to, if you're, if you're a warden and you want to climb up the ladder of promotion, the worst thing is if you have some violent riot where a guard gets killed or something like that happens. All of a sudden, you're on the outs because you bungled it. If you want to manage the prisoners properly, you got to have a good touch. So what they did in Matsqui is they came on really heavy and hard on Pruno, any alcohol beef, but they turned almost a blind eye to pot. So they would actually not check prisoners when they came out of the visiting room because almost 80, 90% of the prisoners were, were, had drug abuser on their jackets and they didn't want any more riots. And the easiest way to play it is let, let them sort of tranquilize themselves and give them these socials. And these socials were great. I mean, when I mean great, I got to bone a girl inside a speaker while the yes. band was playing. They brought in a great big speaker. We made sure the box was sort of stretched out, but we crawled under the tables. <laughs> oh, shit. And, you, and this is right inside the prison. Right? Wow. So um, in, ca in Canada, they would riot against the guards, against the prison. They wouldn't fight with each other. So in California, if there's any message to those guys, it's like, just stop this dumbass racial bullshit, right? Because it's completely counterproductive. You know, in England and in Canada and in the United States, there are lots of progressive, woke people who love prison reform and will jump on it if the guys don't, if they come off as half ass normal. But if you come off as a Nazi, nobody wants to, you know, go to bat for you. Whereas, you know, here in Britain, there's lots of these NGOs and charities and people want to help prisoners when they get out. So, you know, if the prisoner shows the right look, if he starts studying at university or gets, uh, you know, passes his exams or does something, then people will, will try and help you. Yeah. But if your idea of like normal life is to knife somebody because of their race, nobody wants to help you. Exactly. So... Uh, it amazes me that these guys still haven't woken up like, what is it, almost 30 years, 35 years? They're still doing the same dumbass shit. Same shit. North versus South now is the big one, isn't it? No, oh, I mean, it's just. Sereños <laughs> and Norteños, is it? That's it. Yeah, the Emmys versus the Nesters back yeah. in our time. Yeah. So, was John in with Charles Manson or any other famous names? Well, I saw Charles Manson there. Remember we talked about that at Vacaville? Yeah, yeah. You could just, if you went right to the fence, you could look over and they had him in some dog kennels and he was right at the end. Mm -hmm. You could see him squatting there with his dirty hair. So we didn't talk to him, but you could see him if you wanted to. No autographs. <laughs> Any other big names? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, Schwarzenegger came to Quentin, so that's a, that's a pretty <laughs> big name. He wouldn't take off his shirt though. <laughs> Well, because I don't know if you've ever followed Schwarzenegger, but he started out as Mr. Europe bodybuilder for like six years in a row. And then he got into that film. Uh, his first film was Pumping Iron. And it was just down at Gold's Gym, right? Him pumping iron. He's talking shit to the Hulk. And he looks, he looks good and all the rest. But then he finally got picked up from that and he went into that, what's it, Thulsa Doom or... He plays a sort of gothic warrior, you know, fantasy hero with his German accent. And that's where he, he took off. But the thing was, he just made it in Hollywood. And that Hollywood lifestyle had started taking the weight off his, off his uh, physique, right? Mm -hmm. The muscles. And in, in San Quentin, people were serious about weightlifting, so they wanted to see him. But he didn't want to look bad, so he wouldn't take off his shirt. Really? Wow. What about Johnny Cash? Johnny Cash was at Folsom. He came. He came to Quentin before I was there. Okay, but he he came to Folsom also. 
Johnny Cash was, he was really popular. I don't, you listen to his music? Oh, I love um, watching that video on YouTube where he's in the prison. All the prisoners are sat Oh, just, him. yeah. He played to them, yeah. right? The, the yellow turn, water. Turn yellow. the walls down. I want to turn the walls down. Yeah. That's classic, yeah, he had, he had heart. I mean, he was, he'd been in, he'd been in the county jail in Dallas and Texas for different things. And he, he knew how, I mean, Texas is a bad place, right? Yeah. Oh, reputation. Arizona prisoners would get sent to Texas and they would riot on purpose to try and get sent back. It was so intense. I mean. Phil wouldn't even fly over to Texas, right? He, he he had a bad experience there, and he never went back. I had a cellmate who was arrested 150 plus times for petty offenses. He'd done time in New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, California. He said the hole in Texas, it was like a, a coffin. They just slot you into a wall and put you in there. You just piss and shat in, in this. If you refuse to work, well, they they used to say uh, in Texas, you got the right to remain silent. As long as you can stand the pain. <laughs> and on that note, we are at the end of this podcast. That should do it, yeah. Is there anything you would like to say to the people watching this, John, in conclusion? Well, I think we covered it. We got an animal story in there with Chopon the cow. And uh, yeah, I think we've done a pretty good turn this time. Do, do you, does Joe or James have any questions for John? All good, all good. All right, well, we hope you've enjoyed this. Please let us know in the comments what you think. Huge thank you to the new subscribers. Subscription logo's in the bottom corner of the screen. We're going to try and get John to get his book out at some point here in the future. So please be looking out for that. He's, he's brought a batch of uh, stories here. I have read some of them. They're absolutely superb. Just, you know, classic storytelling and abs absolutely captures that 70s, 80s um, prison atmosphere, which came about, it's, it's, it's a unique period in time because now we're in the era of prisons being warehouses, industrial, you know, private prisons and all this. So this is quite unique, what he says. And I know people have been in prison recently saying, oh, that's not how prison works. Well, they weren't in prison in the 70s, that's why. It's a unique period of time. And I'm, I've been absolutely gripped reading his story so far. So looking forward to the book. And I've been sat here absolutely riveted um, today as well. Just like some people have described you as like the uh, Christopher Walken of the true crime podcast scene and your delivery and, and, and the way you speak and mannerisms and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, huge thank you to John James for being here helping us today. And huge thank you to all the viewers who've gone down in our description box and clicked on our socials and our donation links and everything else. Are you, are you? Well, I'd like to say just one yeah, last thing. I, I think that you, you get a lot more flack than you deserve because you're doing good work and you're trying to present the other side and the other point of view, but you're getting uh, a lot of troll action, which you really don't deserve. So that was last year. Um, since Wildman's funeral, which was in um, just before Christmas, actually, from up here. Wild man has just been slaying all of the trolls. And what happened was they started savaging each other, the trolls, just going against each other. So everything on my channel since then has absolutely flourished. So we started out with a record January, almost 60,000 new subs. We've never seen anything like it. I know if it's just going full, full power. Well, again. lockdown will help you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, people sat at home reading watching videos so that's that's all helping as well yeah well i think i think the fascination for this kind of uh, material is based in the fact that we are still the same animal it's just nowadays we live such a, a peaceful life that you know you know the attraction is for something is there right i remember when i just was deported and i was speaking to a soldier who'd just come back from something or other and we were just looking around us. I don't know if it was at an airport or something where I met this guy. And we were just looking at, you know, the civilian population and how we could just see how closeted and taken for granted everything was. And how when you've been through things, you have a completely different perspective from all these people just going about the the ways in this you know, taking it for granted that they were safe and all this stuff and it's quite intense, isn't it, when you first come back oh. from a situation and you, you see it through different eyes, the world through different eyes.
Well, it was really when I when I landed at Heathrow, the the Canadians actually sent two policemen to escort me all the way from Canada. Wow. One on either side in the airplane. I don't know if you got a personal escort. Well, man did. I did not. And these guys brought me to the to the immigration, you know, the lady or whoever it was, the guy who stamps the passport. And they were absolutely shocked because they thought that they were going to be met by the British police who would do something with this this wild <laughs> rabid dog, right? There was nobody. <laughs> and they just looked at, as she stamped my passport and said, well, welcome home, Mr. Abbott. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it was. All right. Are we allowed to hug or are you social distancing? Well, you've got gloves on, but that should do it. Do we move this out of the way, I think? <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Well done. Yep.